Welcome everyone to Senate Education uh, this Friday, February 23rd at 1 o'clock. We are going to start with, looks like we have a great group of people here. Ms. Emerson, how are you? I already said hi to Scott. And please, Secretary Boucher, um, please join us. And we are on track to move a bunch of things by town meeting, well, even before town meeting week and well before crossover, hopefully for a couple of other things. But right now we're working on, and one of them is the CTE bill. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a copy of the bill. Let's see. In our files or no? I'll get one for you. That'd be great, yeah. yeah. But while uh, Morgan's printing one out, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry. We are going to get started. Great. So thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon. For the record, uh, my name is Heather Boucher, and I'm the Interim Secretary of Education. Happy to be here. Um, happy to talk about CTE always. Great. Um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Now, I should say, there is you know, more and more good excitement around CTE stuff. I think just generally <laughs> out there in the air with Vermonters, mm -hmm. um, certainly in the State House. I walked in with Representative Marcotte this morning. I know the House is eager to work on this. I think they're going to work on it with their House Committee as well as, I think they call it economic development over there. Mm -hmm. um, but it's nice because I think the governor has really talked about CTE since he first arrived, and I know this is really important to him. Mm -hmm. so we really appreciate the agency's work on it. So, Thank you. Yeah. It's nice to hear that, and I do agree it's a very important joint policy space that we, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have been able to share in this space, and, and um, I think it's a real source of pride for us and our agency, and I think part of that pride is that we've really partnered well with yeah. the General Assembly over the past several years to actually move the system forward. And um, we do still have um, some challenges, largely around funding and governance. And um, you know, the hope is that this bill will allow us to start to really tackle in a way we haven't before the fiscal challenges for the CTE funding. Um, and what we have proposed, um, and I think that we're in alignment um, with our CTE directors on this, is that, um, look, it's really a huge lift to do fiscal and governance. So let's do fiscal first, and then let's, let's cover governance, because um, that's gonna take a bit, because okay. it's so complicated. Um, there are so many different models of governance. So, what I will share, um, and I'm hoping to come back and really dig more, if it's okay, Mr. Chair, into the fiscal model itself next week. Mm -hmm. Our general counsel is sick with a really Thank nasty cold, yeah. and um, you know she's just not available um, today to actually help us get into this. But um, we're definitely working on it, and we're working with Beth too. Sure. So and Miss St. James just arrived. Hi, Beth. Yeah. I think we're working with you. Send me a calendar, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we had one. I was waiting for that. At the direction of the chair. I was waiting yes. for that. Yes, yes, yes. But we had one, and it's because someone was sick. So I apologize if there was a disconnect there. Yeah. And there's definitely one coming, plus a draft. <laughs> OK. So um, the other piece I want to certainly mention is that for us, the whole purpose of this is to improve access for all students to the beauty that is CTE, the hands-on, the experiential, yeah. um, the exposure to career pathways and different kinds of opportunities that um, you know some students just might not ever understand um, if they're really getting a more traditional classroom experience. So. Um, it could be anything from the culinary um, programs to welding to all kinds, you know, health sciences. And um, we have some just fantastic examples of kids really knocking it out of the park through their engagement with CTEs and really setting themselves up, particularly some of our kids who come from historically marginalized backgrounds, really, really leveraging the CTE system for all it's worth and yeah. really having some amazing outcomes. And um, and I think we saw some numbers at one point, there were some research that shows that if you do get involved, because our dropout rate 
pretty high in some districts. Yes. Right? So if you can get engaged with something like CTE yeah. earlier, get more jazzed about it, carries you through high school. Our, our um, graduation rate is 97% mm -hmm. for students who are, who are in CTE concentrators in CTE. That's great. Yeah. And um, the average is about 86 to 88%, um, depending on the year, for our regular high school population. So mm -hmm. it's a 10% advantage. Um, I've got a, uh, yeah, please go ahead. I've got some really recent data that UVM sent us on that. And we have okay. some districts that I think are as low as 70%. Graduation rates, things like that. Um, but, yeah. Our, um, our, which when, worries me. When, you know? Well, Winooski tends to I'll always be the lowest, but they also okay. have a pretty unique population of yep. students yep. because they Absolutely. have a lot of new Americans. Yep. And so I don't want to... You know, we recognize that, um, but yeah. yes, there's there's definitely variability um, within that. So um, the other thing I would note, which I think you've alluded to already, Mr. Chair, is that given the dire economic and workforce employment issues that Vermont currently faces, it's just really critical that we take full advantage of our CTE system, ensure that we've got seamless entry, seamless exit, um, and you're going to see that in the components of the bill that um, we're really supportive of. Um, Beautiful. So, um, in the testimony that I provided yes, to you, you, and I am working off of the portion um, that is listed under S, is it that 203? S304. 304. 304. I'm just grasping at numbers because they all seem the same to me. So, that's really the version, the latest, I think, version mm -hmm. that I have found. I know that. Um, there's a whole other section that I believe will come back into S304 that we're working on the fiscal component. Is that the intention? Or is that going to be a separate bill? We would put the fiscal component in this. Yeah. Really, frankly, we're looking for as much direction from all of you yeah. as to what you would like us to send to the House. Then we'll make our yeah. decisions. Yeah. But um, we are open. Yeah. yeah. So our plan is to actually have that language for you next week. I know you right. want to get this out of committee. So that's the plan. Great. At um, sufficiently more detail fiscal than- Fiscal language. Yes, the fiscal okay. language. Um, right. Sufficiently more detail than I think um, I realized there was a, it wasn't enough. So okay. we're gonna, um, what, we, what we put in um, place first just wasn't quite where we need to be. So, um, and I can talk more about that um, in when I get, because I'm just gonna kind of walk through the bill a bit. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we get to that section, I'll talk more um, about what, what we anticipate that looking like. Yeah. So, um, and I can start actually um, in the introduction. So, um, one of the things that I think got a little um, confusing, and I will take ownership of this and apologize, is that we are and um, we're moving. The intent is to move away from a tuitioning model um, for CTE, and the idea there is that it will actually allow for more seamless entry for um, students, it will remove some um, economic pressures that LEAs feel if the money for CTE is coming off the top of the Ed Fund. They don't have to worry about it being in their local budget. It will just be taken care of. Um, and so that's the whole premise of why we're trying to work on um, the funding. And the, what that would look like is ultimately providing block funding to the CTE centers. Um, for a transition period based on their prior year operating costs. And that's the piece that didn't come through with testimony earlier this week and I want to talk about and we'll talk about more fully next week. So the idea is we're not going to get into the full-time student estimates right away. We're actually going to use the previous year's operating costs just okay. as a block. Mm -hmm. Send that out to the CTEs. Um, and you know we need a couple of years to do that to look at like were there problems i mean this is a big change like it's a big change and so we want to look at like what what was the impact of that um did it go smoothly we're going to obviously do everything we can to make it go smoothly but we need to kind of seed that construct first of like getting the direct allocations out to the cte's then in fiscal year 28 the idea is we would then move to what are your fte's by program um, what are your other overhead costs? Um, and really have that more robust model that really gets into a much more in the weeds, um, 
very, very, I mean, they're both accurate, but it's just, it, it allowed that, that ultimate part would allow the state to have more um, say in what programs are actually invested in. I think that we're going to need to have some conversations um, in the General Assembly and with the administration about that, because I think that um, is also a substantial change. Um, right now, um, the CTEs, you know, um, are doing their very best um, to meet local and state need. But that, and this is, by, I forgot to say this, by the way, this is actually in response to um, the request from um, the General Assembly to um, take the um, findings, results, suggestions, um, recommendations from um, what we call the APA report um, on CTE fiscal um, finance and governance and present our implementation plan to you all. I forgot to like, just <laughs> high level signpost that, that like, that's where this is coming from. And You're doing great. in that report, that's where the notion, because other states have done this, and I think that's where they're getting it, that's where the notion of this program by program allocation is coming from. We would argue we probably may want to get there, but we need some other steps in the meantime, especially right now, because we don't want to completely destabilize the system, as we already know. There's a lot going on. So, um, so that I'm saying that because um, I'm suggesting some slight changes to that first bullet point under under the introduction to flesh it out a little bit more. So it's not really it's not changing the construct. It's just making sure that we're also identifying that there's a step. In our view, there's a stepwise process to get there. Okay, and I'm just going to pause for a moment, yep. Ms. St. James. Feel free at any point if you have any questions. Um, I already have a calendar invite. Ex officio, <laughs> member, ex officio <laughs> member of the committee, uh, just let us know. And do you have this? I do. Beautiful. Please continue. Um, also, item four under the introduction um, requiring the agent, Agency of Education to create an SUs to adopt a model comprehensive career development policy. I think at one point, by the way, I think I saw that there was a change to having model CTE policy, and we don't support that, and I want to talk a little bit about that. So this really is about a model career development policy for us, and the idea here is that our students um, from seventh grade on have PLPs, personalized learning plans. Um, they do a nice job of largely capturing and helping students plan with close adults um, at school and their families about what courses they're going to take, what opportunities, including CTE, um, they uh, or other flexible pathways they should be engaging in. But we're still missing um, a component that I think other states have really knocked out of the park with. So um, Tennessee is an example and some others where they just have a really robust way of actually ensuring that each student has a very concerted conversation um, and you know very in-depth conversation starting back even in middle school about like the career, their employment development, those kinds of things. This is not meant at all to blame or knock down our um, public school system. It, it quite honestly um, is a function I would say across the board because our school counselors are now being faced with all kinds of different um, challenges. Um, you know, we do have a mental health crisis. Um, we do have a lot of um, students in need. And so understandably, our school counselors, the first, one of the things to go in a wholesale way has been the focus on career advising, career counseling, those kinds of things, which many of us, myself included, had access to in high school. So our approach to that is to actually have um, both the SUs and the CTE centers because they really shine in this area. I mean, they're, they're part and parcel of how we're building a career development um, system for our state to really have them partnering together um, so that each student will have um, a career, um, you know, a, a, so that each district has a comprehensive career development policy in place. And, we're very happy to um, develop a model policy for that. Um, we're happy with the language that you know the um, supervised reunion could just take that, and that could be it. Um, but so, and this is number four still. Yep. Yep. So, requiring the use of education to create 
and have supervisory unions implement, implement okay, in and partnership. The piece that's right. new is really making sure that it's in partnership with CTE. Like yep. that's kind of why it's in this bill. Um, so because again, it, it's a capacity issue at the local level, and we think that um, to the extent that um, CTE that. would like to partner in those efforts, that would be a good thing. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I remember when I was working in a library and I used to help our, we had a career director and we would put on a big career fair every year. And one of the things that we talked about a lot is that um, the careers that these kids will be going into or don't even exist yet. Like they, mm -hmm. they haven't even, <laughs> we don't know what they're going to be because of technology moving so fast and now with AI. And um, so I, I guess how, how does this, how would these plans kind of um, play with or work with this notion of, you know, a future that is so incredibly mm -hmm. unclear, uncertain? Mm -hmm. Well, we haven't done the model policy yet, but um, so when I think about what that might look like, I think it, we would very likely interlace it very closely with um, the transferable skills that are already in um, flexible pathways and personalized learning plans. Um, and really, I agree with you, it has to be about your learning. Um, it's not about necessarily like this is the job or career you're going to have, like the minute you step out of um, off the high school graduation stage. It could be yeah. for some students if that's what fits their personal trajectory and plan, and that's what they want. But it also, um, I think, just as much will need to focus on here are the transferable skills that you're already very familiar with students um, from our Act 77 work, and here's either how they specifically translate to thinking about your career development or here are some additional um, transferable skills that you really need to think about. So, you know, for instance, um, how are you going to sort of, how are you going to, I'm thinking I'm from a student's perspective, like how are you going to make peace with the fact that things are constantly going to be changing? I mean, they already know that because they're, they're so immersed in, um, they're so immersed in um, social media, but to, to kind of draw those threads together of, you know, you're even saying that to them would be part of what we would recommend, right? Which is like, so the world is changing a lot. There's good aspects of that. There's bad aspects of that as you're a person kind of experiencing that. Um, so I think it's a really good question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yes, in our weeks. Can I go backwards just yeah. a little bit to the very beginning of your uh, yeah. testimony? So you mentioned that uh, you, um, you wanted to put the fiscal aspects first and the governance aspects second. In mm -hmm. priority, so I'm I'm, I'm wondering as because as you're going through the bill now, are you recommending that the governance sections be struck or just kind of de-emphasized? De-emphasized because okay. there still are in the fiscal piece which we present next week. There still are a couple of governance pieces we have to actually cover for the fiscal to work, but. Um, why we want that to kind of be step two of our hopeful final state push to really, really improve the CTE system is because there's so much complexity in our governance that it will take a lot of work to really figure out, like, I think there's general agreement, like, that's not what we want, but it's what is it that we want? And I think that, I think that's probably going to be, like, the whole session, I, I in my view, like, next, next session. I don't. I think it would be hard to actually even make a full decision, and I would look to my colleagues in the CTE um, centers to also weigh in on that. Um, I think it's hard to imagine, unless there really were, which I don't think this is the way we want to do things, unless there really were, here's what's happening, boom, make it happen. That's not typically the way we make policy um, in Vermont. That's clear. Yep. Yeah. yeah, so there's four different governance structures right now. Um, including two kind of satellite campuses, which really, that's not really governance per se, but that's where um, education is happening. Okay. Um, I did want to also note that um, requiring the Agency of Education to develop a statewide school calendar. Um, we actually support this. Um, we think it's a good thing. I think, though, I question whether it belongs in the CTE bill because I think it's actually a much broader education um, piece and um, there are a lot of dependencies. Um, it certainly 
would assist in streamlining CTE participation. There's no question about that. But there's a lot of other dependencies and um, aspects that need to be worked through um, for the whole education system to actually get to a statewide agreed upon calendar. This has been tried many, many times. Um, Senator Weeks, I think you have a. No, oh, no, I'm watching. I'm watching for your reaction. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you, perhaps the committee already talked about this. No, we just heard. You know, for years. Yeah. Since yeah. I was in the house, people talk about these statewide calendars. Yeah. And my understanding is, you know, there's just, it's really hard because, like, I think, right, the South and the North kind of have, their off a week yeah. or something like that. And so it becomes like a game of chicken, like, who wants to change their whole schedule? Yeah. Um, what we would actually um, support instead as perhaps a step to get there from a CTE perspective is to require at the regional level around the CTEs that there are shared bell times, which is a different way to align calendars. And so, and it's what I hear about a lot um, is, you know, students, because I get complaints, we get complaints at the agency. And so, you know, from hearing from students or, um, and so, sometimes from our CTE colleagues as well, like we have a student who routinely has to miss um, the first 15 minutes of their English class because right. the calendars mm -hmm. don't align. And that's actually, that's a problem. We're not, we're, not, yeah. we're not doing our job of actually providing that equitable education that our Constitution actually mandates us to do for that kiddo. Or they have to miss, you know, fake example, half an hour of, like they have to miss the second half hour of their manufacturing program in CTE. Mm -hmm. Also the same issue, like we can't have them missing things. So, so how do we actually um, figure that out? And given the current governance structure, that really has to be at that regional level because, as I'm sure um, my colleagues who um, run CTE programs will say, uh, there's just a lot of different high schools, each with their own calendars, that are all feeding into the CTEs. And so what can we do at the state level to really facilitate that and say, OK, you've really got to get together and figure this part out. That will, that's a huge lift. Yeah. But, um, I think it may be easier to do if it's at that regional level than a full statewide school calendar. So I uh, certainly understand the complications of trying to synchronize bell times and calendars mm -hmm. and su such, but as far as like a, a legislative vehicle, you said maybe this is not the right vehicle. Is there another vehicle that you're eyeballing that would, would allow this language to be introduced? Um, I think that there's a miscellaneous ad bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Senator Weeks. Okay. So then my question yeah. is, is that a viable vehicle from I mean, it is. It's, we're under the same time right. constraints, but the House, I believe, has agreed to send us one, so we could always okay. add it there. So it's not a crossover right. crisis. Yeah. And just to follow up, sorry, just to follow up, I mean, I, I do think there probably would need to be substantial testimony on that, just given, yeah, so I mean, I don't it's... Know. Ours doesn't sound like we would have the time. Well, uh, it's not just a CTE yeah. policy decision. And so I think that's why we're saying, like, uh, we're a little worried about it being in this particular bill. So you're saying, so you're just, I think, Senator Weeks bring up a really good point. We have two weeks left. We're not going to probably get to it, given our other pressing issues. Is that going to be OK? We didn't suggest. This, Got this language Got didn't it. come from us. Got it. So, okay. um, so, um, so we would be fine with that. Great. But but we also want to understand like the we understand like where it came from and why it's okay. a good idea. I think Senator, Senator Hushin had a um, question. I I think I answered my own question, but thank you. Okay. Um I said right there, Senator Weeks, I just didn't give you a minute to look at it, that we recommend moving this item to the miscellaneous education bill or similar vehicle. Um, yeah, and just talk about that. Um, under Section 1552 of the proposed bill, we would recommend removing Section D because this is still framed around the tuitioning model, and we're moving from that um, to a block allocation, as I've already talked about. Similarly, 1561, we recommend changing the title from tuition reduction to funding allocations. And here's where I get into. I've lost you. Hey, I'm sorry. I'm back to my um, my um, testimony. Right, I understand document. where. I am on the first page. 
where it says, in the middle of the page, it says section 1561, and it's crossed through. Top of our second page. page. Top of our second page. Thank you. Can I? Yeah. Uh, Block allocations mean different things to different people. Yep. Can you just very briefly? Yeah. Seems so, like a major concept shift. Yep. So what we're proposing is that for a transition time of two years, mm -hmm. that we would pilot, if you will, or have a transition where we're getting a block grant out to the CTEs to really finesse and fine tune that mechanism. So the whole point is that if we're doing direct funding, we would also base it on um, the previous year's full operational expenses. Any, we'd have, a, we'd have a system for the CT centers to say, hey, we're building a new program. Um, our last year's operation expenses aren't quite going to be right. Or they could even say, like, we're, we're getting rid of a program, and so our operation costs have gone down. So that would be part of the process. Um, and we would do that for two years. And then we would go back to um, the FTE model, where we're getting much more deeply into um, the allocation itself. So the money simply would not flow through the LEA back Correct. to the CT? Correct. Okay. And that's back to what I said originally, which is um, it's not to penalize or anything like that, the, EL the LEAs. In fact, many of them, I think, would be happy to not have to worry about um, when they get late tuitioning or things like that. It's just already kind of taken care of off the top of the head fund. But what about when students are kind of 50-50 between the LEA? Well, we, we think that would be captured um, on average, right? Um, by And we would also, um, you'll see next week, like we'd also have a hold harmless and things like that for those two years. We think that would be still captured by the estimate of their operating costs the okay. year before. But eventually, um, and, and our governance, who knows, our governance model might end up saying we want all CTEs to be one FTE. They're not right now. They're half and one. So we do need to get that back in. We do need to get that FTE piece back in. So what we're asking is um, a more simplified methodology um, based on the previous year's um, estimate of operating to really directly allocate those funds out. And then after that transition period, moving into a more robust methodology for um, uh, um, calculating those allocations. Does it, would this would the implication be though that for those two years the operating costs are essentially frozen, meaning they can't if you're anticipating like student growth, if you're basing it on the previous year's budget, yeah. But then you go into the second year, the second year is flat, but you're hoping for growth or new programs, is it kind of flat? It's not flat. So, um, I mean, it, the, the start is flat, but the CTEs will have an opportunity to um, make an argument like we have a new program kicked in or we need new resources in this area that is in that, that would raise our, excuse me, would raise our operating costs for the next fiscal year. Okay. And that's spelled out in the language that I'm going to come and talk about next week. So what's the downside of doing this? I mean, what's the, is there any risk in doing it as a block grant for two years around operations, or do you see any concerns? Um, I think it'll be a big shift um, for the LEAs, just in terms of what they're used to. Um, I think it'll be a big shift potentially for the CTEs, because they're used to getting, and I would, I would certainly want you to ask them, um, they're, they're typically getting, um, I, don't, I don't know the mechanics if they get all their funds together, I don't think so. They get like a base appropriations mm -hmm. from AOE that might come earlier and then they get their tuition amount, um, I think a little bit later in their academic year. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the one part I will say in all transparency is um, the part that makes me, the part that's different is we're relying on those operating costs without voter approval those two years. Mm -hmm. um, however, what made me feel okay about that is we do the same thing for early college, we do the same thing for dual enrollment, we do the same thing for some of our other allocations that come off the top of the Ed Fund. Voters don't really vote on those other than in terms of their overall, they don't, they don't have a line item, for instance, on um, early college or dual enrollment. 
And I think once we actually get um, the full model working, when we actually um, really move into the governance that we want as a state, we could eventually see that, that um, sorry, because I know that <laughs> Jody already told me it would be great not to have to warn a budget, but I do think we have to get back to that. That has to be the model, and so that is the part that um, you know. I think that there's we have to be comfortable with for this two-year transition period. We're gonna we're gonna focus on the direct allocation piece off the top of the Ed Fund, and then we're gonna actually get much more into okay that worked. Now, how do we actually really fine tune what that budget is, including voters actually getting to weigh in? Center weeks. Oh, I was just curious. Um, you started you started talking about FTEs for you know, mm -hmm. you know, two years, you know, down the road. Mm -hmm. uh, does student waiting waiting have an impact on all that conversation? In terms, well, um, it could. You mean in terms of like their demographic variables yeah, yeah, yeah. or yeah, English language? Second. Yeah, English um, language. I think that's something that we. Um, we w should probably think about. Um, I'm a little hesitant because of you know, the conversations right now about our people yeah. waiting. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, it could. What we frame this as largely is around what it costs for kind of, I guess, an average student um, to actually participate in the program. Like, and it's, and that it changes, you know, those costs are different from program to program. So there's a different cost mm -hmm. to educate a student in a culinary program as there is to educate a student in um, the auto mechanics program. So that's the way we framed it, but this is a good question. It's perhaps something we should be thinking about as we, and again, I think the timeline we've put out gives us time to really wait, you know, really um, chew on some of those, um, some of those Thank questions. Um, could I just finish yeah, one please. more thing? Yep. So I think the part of this two-year transition is um, we also want to keep things stable for the CTE system because there is a lot going on right now. And so that's what we're trying to do is like, all right, let's directly allocate, but we're basically going to keep things stable other than you'll have an opportunity as a CTE center to say we need a little bit more money or we need a little bit less money. I... I'm excited about these changes because I remember in Essex, it was at the Essex um, Inn years ago. Were you at that? We had a big um, get together with a bunch of CTE yes. folks. Yeah, and we were. And the two CTEs were yeah, there. And yeah, that was, how great. was the yeah. MC. And we were talking yes. about all this. Yes. So I'm so happy to see that it's coming to fruition. I'm, I, I'm a little concerned, though, as I think about the financial debacle that we're in the middle of right now and, the, and just that sort of chaos that mm -hmm. this is going to be sort of coming on the heels of that hopefully it won't be problematic and I'm also thinking about the block grants in terms of um, operating costs of CTEs and inflation I'm just I'm so we'll, concerned we'll have that in okay, next great. week yeah Super. we have an inflationary adjustment in there and we also have a hold harmless like so we have some of those pieces in there the other thing I would say I'm um, just to extend that um, we're not anticipating this would be some kind of new massive ask of the Ed Fund. There might be, due to cost, due to inflationary costs and things that we're already talking about, there might be like little bubbles of increase. Um, but it's already being paid out of the Ed Fund. We're basically, we're basically trying to change how it's delivered to the CTEs, so if that makes sense. Nice, thank you. For the second time in a row, I think. It you just answered my question. Um, exactly. no, I didn't think I was psychic, but perhaps. It all comes yeah, yeah. He gets it. He gets it. Congratulations. Um, um, I would say, uh, remembering that this is going to go to the House, whatever you bring it to us next week, it's sounding more and more like this is going to go to finance. So we are not going to be able to get everything done. So just, I would say, keep that in mind before you, we see you next Tuesday. Yep. Sure. Yeah, just we've got to wrap this up and knowing that the house will add whatever we might not get to. Yes, I think I think we're going to be in really good shape. Okay. I do. Um, it's been sketched out already. I, I we just need the right. attorneys. Right, time to take testimony and understand the ins and outs in our finance committee. But yeah. just just know that I'm a yeah teensy bit concerned. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I was going to say is, um, from my perspective, we need. Ledge Council and General Council to just make sure that the right and Miss St. James is ready. Yes, to are. make sure that the she language is ready yeah, is so. in full legal 
Great. Form. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Under section 15, is this an okay pace? I feel like we're just kind of droning yeah, along. Yeah, this is good. Nope. Okay, good. Um, under section 1541A, and by the way, um, if I haven't noted sections, we've got no changes to make. We think that it's delightful the way it is. Um, so I would recommend, we would recommend removing section three because that also um, stipulates tuitioning and we don't need that given our new model. Um, section four under, number four under that section, um, we had intended to have um, virtual experience um, because we want this to be flexible. So um, after speaking with um, CTE colleagues actually yesterday, um, they reminded me of that need for flexibility, which I wholeheartedly support. And so I apologize that this highlighted language um, was supposed to be in the original because um, we weren't intending that every year, every student um, in middle school has to go to a CTE center. That would be really, really tough to, mm. to um, maneuver. Yeah, but, I think Senator Dulick also may have raised the yeah, cost. The cost. No time. Yeah. yeah, and so we're, and I would also um, love to hear from um, the CTE director colleagues because I've put in some language around equivalent virtual experience. I think the point is we just want mm -hmm. this to be flexible enough mm -hmm. that it gets students exposed to what we want them exposed to, but the way that happens is is flexible and can be dictated at um, the local level. I will say, given that though, that not that never visiting a CTE center throughout one's whole middle school, I think, would be problematic yeah. because um, we really do want them to set foot at least once on that campus. It's it's kind of a different campus, just like. When you're talking about the post-secondary um, realm, it's like much more compelling and meaningful for students to actually set foot on an actual campus than to visit it virtually. Mm -hmm. So um, we're mindful that we want it to be as flexible as possible, but also don't want to completely lose the campus visit. And I think we're pretty much all in agreement in terms of the centers and, and us on that. Um, yeah, please. So we're so. Section three, um, the one I'm recommending we remove. On yeah. So which is it, which uh, subsections go away too? Are, are any of those like there's A and then there's one, two, three? Are we, we're keeping all those, right? We would just remove any that pertain to the tuitioning okay. itself. Sorry if that wasn't clear. I should have, no, 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 that's I should have clarified right. that. It should have been probably 3A or whatever that letter is that speaks to tuition and apologies. Exactly. No, no worries. Yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah. Um, I already covered subsection 1547A1 in terms of um, the role of CTE centers in assisting SUs with the um, comprehensive career development policy. And then the final section, um, and I wanted to kind of talk about this a little because I think I heard from our folks that there was a question about the post-secondary program alignment. Um, so we haven't yet engaged with the VSC, and part of that is because, as you know, um, I'm really, well, as you know, they're under tremendous stress um, fiscally and operationally and organizationally right now. and so. We think this is a good idea, so this is actually state requirements around CTE progressions um, to the Vermont State Colleges. Um, CCV does this already in many ways, um, so it would really be the General Assembly kind of really requiring that more of the four-year um, part of Vermont State University. But I hadn't, we hadn't approached them because I didn't want them to kind of until we got sort of like some feedback from all of you that it was something that you were interested in pushing forward on, I didn't want to kind of um, freak them out, <laughs> for lack of a better term. Yeah. And so, because I am very well, sensitive. They've seen the language. Okay. Yeah. And um, they've seen it. I mean, I don't know if they've. Um, we, we gave it to them. Okay. Uh, they were in here. Okay. Um, they are considering it. Okay. So great, so we're primed now to but talk with them. I think they really need a phone call. Yep, 
Yeah. Yeah. And I know I saw so. Frank in the fall earlier. She was going to pop in and just generally say they're looking at it. They definitely have some questions and concerns, but they really appreciate hearing from the agency. Yeah. So, and I'm happy to just flag out for them, like uh, just lay out for them what the thinking was on that, um, why we didn't, I really was trying to kind of protect them. Like if this was not going to fly and like no one was interested in it, I didn't want to, they're really okay. under the gun yeah. right so now. Oh, no. I thought you were pointing to something. Senator Weeks. Nope. You good? No, I, I'm actually uh, quite, uh, uh, quite excited about the first, this is the first reference to a mm -hmm. K to 16. I would. Uh, I was thinking to myself because of our involvement with uh, health and welfare. Actually, birth to sixteen, mm -hmm. grade sixteen. Mm -hmm. We'll go where, there. Where are you? Uh, I'm in her testimony. Yeah. Fifteen ninety four section. Of this, uh, uh, our page two. Oh, yeah. Sort okay. of, uh, okay. yeah. You would not know this, um, secretary. Um, secretary. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Senator Weeks. <laughs> You want to be the secretary? Um, <laughs> <laughs> You've got that job. Not so quick. I am sorry, Mr. Chair. I know that we're. Oh, no. no. It's Friday. <laughs> um, there is a PK 16 council that the General Assembly um, has actually um, put yeah, into law, but we have. It's a little short sighted. It's, it's, it's we, have, we haven't met in a, in a long, long time. I think it's just been one of those um, projects yeah. that um, was doing some good work and then just. Um, you know, the state all around, not just the state agency, but all partners. We just moved on to other stuff, but I thought you might find that interesting. We have a lot of stuff on PK-16 in there. That's what, why um, I was reminded of that. Anything That's else? all I have. <clears throat> so uh, I'm looking to see if Ledge Council has any questions for the secretary at this point. No, I do not. No, you do not, all right. I, uh, <clears throat> since I'm getting a sense that generally I think the committee's okay with these, um, why don't, if you can stick around, we will actually hold off from hearing from Ledge Council so we can, sure, because I think that would be really brief, and hear from our other witnesses yep. from the CTE programs. If that works for you, it Mr. certainly Farr. does. Well, I, I appreciate that, but I'm wondering, I was asking Mr. Farr and Ms. Emerson. Oh. Uh, Let me text Melissa Connor because she thinks that at a different time and see if she can join us. We can, always, we can always have her also another time. Ms. Emerson, while you're here, would you mind joining us at the table? I am fine with it, but actually Scott has the first oh, we, we had like a group effort you did. and sections sorted out on how we were going to approach this. Yeah. You can even ah. see it in our testimony. <laughs> okay. Um, and we'll talk to the council. And then we might need to take a break. And then if you Perfect. guys, we have our uh, We're at three. Intro. We just want to hear it all. Yep, yep. We're just trying to move it along a little bit. So I would love it if um, that I would be for that. OK. Ms. St. James, great to see you. Um, committee, any questions from Ms. St. James on any of these sections? Or proposals to the agency of education. Yes, yeah. that's St. James Office of Legislative Council. We walked through S304 as introduced yesterday? Wednesday. Yeah. Wednesday. It's Wednesday. But, no, it does. It is, if you want some high overview, if you have anything at all, we've got some time here. So. Uh, not trying to fill time, we're going to take a break, but this is a great opportunity. So I know that we're not anticipating a formal fiscal note, but is there a fiscal impact? So we can so ask um, Ms. Richter for that. We'll ask how to do that. Do you mind just kind of giving us a very high? We know it was Wednesday, but we've all had a lot going on in committees and out of committees. Sure. Thanks. So let's go to page two, section one, um, and two. Sections one and two are proposed amendments to the uh, tuition for CTE centers as it exists now, moving from the six semester average um, or the average of the district's three prior years to the year's full time equivalent 
you just heard testimony that there's a recommendation to not include those and I have a meeting with AOE scheduled for Wednesday um, and so we'll talk about effective dates for that um, when I meet and whatever draft you get next we'll have that incorporated yeah. Sorry, um, um, can we back up, mm -hmm. back to page one? We talked a little bit about, um, so you're gonna take the tuition piece out, right? Number one, at the beginning of the page? Uh, yes, potentially. I have some questions about the effective date of that and whether or not it would need to remain in law for another year oh, yes. or so. Yeah. Um, okay. So we're not talking fiscal year 25. That gotcha. would be utter debacle. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would. Yes. Very frightening. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. sorry. No. And, on the sidelines. And uh -huh. mm -hmm. so, and my other question was just around the four, number four on page one. Mm -hmm. Do we want to add language <clears throat> there, or is it not necessary, uh, in terms of including? transferable skills or PLPs, or do we want to make any references to sort of work that's already being done around? For so um, the comprehensive career development yeah. policy? I'm looking at the secretary. Secretary Fouché, what do you think of that? We talked about it for a while yesterday. We're on page one, line four, or lines 15 and 16, number four, career development policy. Could we expand that so that we incorporate all the different things that you talked about, sure. transferable skills, using the, um, Tra uh, the PLPs, the PLPs yeah. personalized learning um, things. all that kind of thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And I have another question that I should know because I'm a school board member, um, but when the Agency of Ed develops a model policy, it is at the discretion of districts to use it, right? They don't, it's not a mandate, correct? Depends on how sure. the laws are. Right. Okay. <laughs> Agreed. And in this case, it doesn't sound like. I mean. It, so the way this section four is drafted currently, and I will go back, and your next draft will have references to the secretary's testimony of those additional concepts, mm -hmm. um, as far as the comprehensive career development policy. Okay. Um, if you look at page five. Mm -hmm. um, line five. Subsection B, it requires each SU board to develop, to develop, adopt, and ensure implementation of a policy that's at least as comprehensive as the model policy. I think we may have talked about this in the very initial high-level walkthrough, and then I failed to mention it on Tuesday. Policy development is usually a school district um, duty. It's specifically enumerated in there. Um, in this particular situation, you know, if you're looking for a larger policy, right, for supervisory to be supervisory union wide, um, I don't think there's anything illegal about that. But um, school districts are usually the ones developing the educational policies for their districts on that level. Right. Um, but anyway, to answer your question, Senator Gulick, this does require the adoption of a policy. The, the comprehensive career development policy? Yes. Page five. To create and supervise you to adopt. Right, got you. Yep. That's the key, to adopt. Okay. So are you okay with that, do you think? I don't think so. Okay. I, have to, I might have to think about yeah. it over the weekend, but I think I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then there's some implementation. Section five is implementation dates um, that I will certainly take direction from AOE on right. um, and then the uh, there's the intent language on page six on the construction aid career and technical education including them in any new state aid for school construction program section seven is the CPE oversight um, changes where we're substituting secretary for state board to reflect the change in oversight from the State Board of Education to the Agency of Education. Wait, I'm just looking around. How do people feel about that? Who else would you need to hear from? Do you want to hear from the chair of the State Board? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm also just looking at the secretary to say, 
Yeah. Maybe give us some more logic yeah. behind it. We heard I, a little I, bit, yeah. I realized, well, I didn't talk about this one, I realized that. I it's, a big, it's a big change. It's a big change. Yeah. Largely for us, it's coming from the agency does have rulemaking authority. Mm -hmm. Ever since we've been an agency, we do. We've done that with um, district quality standards so far. It really is for us, um, and we do think we have the capacity to do this, especially we're asking, you know, in the budget, there's a new CTE person. That's right. Um, which, by the way, sorry, just to pause, can, did we talk about having that person in this? Yes, we talked about putting it in the next draft. Beautiful. Yes. Okay. Um, the, the CTE rules in rule right now have literally been sitting there for about 20 years. Maybe a little more. Yeah. Maybe even a little more. Ooh, and so it's, at the state board? Yes. And so that is not a knock on the that. state board. Yeah, yeah. It's truly a capacity issue. And there's a lot that the state board is being charged to do and will continue to do. So really, for us, it's about we can get this done. We did it with DQS. We want to do it with CTE. I, I think it makes total sense. I do, too. I, you know, we have a bill on the state board. I've got some ideas. I, yeah, I think this moves us in a good direction. Having a secretary do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know enough to know. Okay. And it would be helpful to have a, a okay. testimony yeah. from the affected individual, the chairman, the yeah. state board chair, or president, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Mr. Chair, can I clarify? Yeah, please. So we would actually follow the same exact process because that's actually specified in law. So there would be no difference in the rulemaking process, um, whether it's the State Board of Ed or whether it's the Agency of Ed. We have to follow the LCAR, ICAR, all of that stuff, just to clarify. Yeah. Do Not you, that I'm saying you... No, I just... Uh, I don't mean that as a counter to what you just said. I just no, wanted to I, clarify a little my, bit. My hesitation is, you know, I don't know if there's a power play. I don't know what the dynamics are. Sure. Uh, you know, and if, and if the individual sits there and says, yeah, this is a great idea because of capacity or whatever the rationale is, you good. Fantastic. Have you talked to the state board? Did you ask them? Um, did I on this one? I'm not sure. Okay. Um, but I will. Would you? That would be great. We'll still have Jennifer in, but yeah, um, that would be terrific if you'd be willing to uh, yeah. reach out to her. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. And, and if it, I mean, hypothetically, if it, if it is a power issue, then it's up to us to decide, right? Right, I get right. that. But yeah. I don't know what the issue is. Right, okay. Except yeah. for well, it capacity. sounds like it's a capacity issue. Yeah. But, I mean, that's as um, simple as that. Instead yeah. of having me ponder this uh, adopt model policy bit over the weekend, yeah. we just have some experts in the, in the field that might be able to speak to it. Sure. So I don't know, like the bees, the bees, I guess. Right? Or. Or a superintendent, or because I mean I don't, I'm not exactly sure what it would. This be is the them. so this is the same process um, that you all used in the school branding model policy mm -hmm. adoption. I believe it's the same as the hazement, hazement, hazing, harassment, and bullying policy. And possibly the direction we're going in with with this. Well, that didn't require the adoption. That didn't require the adoption to show. Um, yes. Model health policy. Model, yes. Yeah. So there are areas of the law where that exists, but how that works on a field level, you're absolutely right. It would be the most likely the bees. Great. We're running out of time. That's all. Yeah, I mean, you know, I know what you mean with that. We're just. Well, that's true. Or we can. No, we'll do it. House. No, we'll do it. We'll do it. Oh. Here we go. S three or four for bees. Two days of them. Uh, great. Please. Keep going. Yeah, Section please. 8 is the transfer of rulemaking authority from state board to uh, AOE. Yeah. And then Section 9 is the post-secondary program alignment, the requirement for the articulation agreements between yeah. secondary CTE centers and the Vermont State Colleges Corporation for the specifically enumerated subjects. Yeah. yeah. We wanted to add building traits to that, to those uh, four, making it five. Yeah. Sure. These young men. He's got the trophy. It's all the truth. And he answers his own questions. That's right. Even better. That's right. Uh, President Berg and Drake are going to be here in 10 minutes. So let's take a 10 minute break. Welcome back to Senate Education. Um, following up on Senator Weeks' question a little bit for the end of committee. 
we are going to have a conversation about PCBs. We are trying to figure out, it looks like we do have a vehicle. H486 was not voted out of this committee. Uh, so we might use that as a vehicle um, to have a conversation about PCB, but we need to hear from the Attorney General uh, who's coming in next week, um, Agency of Natural Resources. So either we will look at it or the House will look at it, and also the pro tem is out, so of course we need to have conversations with our various parties about it. But the short of it is the agency uh, in the, the administration has taken, it seems like a shift around whether or not, you know, from testing PCBs, mandatory testing, to now putting a pause. And I think some people feel as though maybe the larger institutions, the most dangerous institutions out there built during a certain period of time have been covered. So it says nothing to you with you, Mr. President. Yeah, I, yeah I appreciate, we appreciate you being here. We just wanted to sort of clear that up for our many folks that follow us, including uh, who was invited today by someone who's still figuring it out, Ethan. Um, <laughs> <wasn't>. <laughs> uh, Dr. Burke, thanks a million for being with us. Sure. We know you are serving as the interim president of Vermont State University, and we've not had you in, and we have met the chancellor, and we'd just love to know a little bit more about you. Uh, any goals or objectives you might have while you are in this role, yeah. and uh, some information on you know the, the, the Vermont State University in general and how things from your perspective, which is a really unique perspective, sure. you're the interim and you might I don't know if you're looking for the gig itself full time, but it would be great to hear your thoughts on right. the university overall. Well, I just want to thank you for having me today and to thank you for your support, which. Uh, you know, has been invaluable as we're in our first year here at VTSU and, and uh, moving things forward. Um, let me talk a little bit just briefly about myself in case you're not familiar with my background, but this represents a return to Vermont and the Vermont State College system for me. I previously had spent 19 years at uh, what was then Johnson State College. In fact, I dug this out to realize it was a little dated, but. Uh, um, so I'm sorry, you were the president of Johnson State? I was not the president. Not. I was, I was uh, in my final position I was in there was, I was uh, Dean of uh, Student Life and Community Relations. Okay. Uh, uh, so, uh, but I had been there for 19 years in student facing roles uh, at Johnson. And I'll just note that the last probably half dozen years that I was there, I had a number of roles at what was then the system level. Of course, now these are, the, the series of campuses are now um, part of VTSU. But um, I chaired the, the Student Affairs Council, which were the deans of students at the various campuses, uh, Johnson, Vermont Tech, Linden, uh, Castleton, and actually we worked with CCB at the time as well. Um, and so had an opportunity through that uh, to spend time on all of the campuses um, and to develop uh, colleagues and, uh, and friendships across the campuses. And then I also advised in the last several years that I was there a group called the VSCSA, which was the, the student leadership from across the various, uh, again, then separate colleges and actually would accompany students here annually to the State House as part of that uh, for their legislative day. So, I had experience across uh, the, the various campuses uh, prior um, to, to my return. And I think I was interested in coming back to this uh, given, you know, and I was following, obviously, I've, I've followed the, the situation of the, of the last few years, uh, have many, again, friends and colleagues who are, who have been here throughout and uh, with, with great interest and concern. And, and so when this opportunity came up, I, I, the reason that I really was interested in it is because I've seen firsthand the impact of, of these campuses um, on the state, how they provide opportunity for students and Vermonters especially uh, that, that weren't found in other places. And also, uh, I really appreciate and understand the impact that these campuses have on the areas that they're in the regions that they're located in as a economic and cultural uh, driver and real hub and anchor for those regions and communities. And I believe when the system was established, I mean, these, these campuses were intentionally located in in areas to to, uh, to serve traditionally underrepresented areas. So um, I think for those reasons, I mean, I see the importance of, uh, of, of uh, maintaining a strong future for now VTSU. Um, you know, I'll be frank, I'm three months in, we have, right. we have our share of challenges, right? Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, 
uh, one of where I'm devoting a lot of my time and effort right now is just simply uh, building trust, uh, making sure people feel that there's uh, genuine um, input and inclusion in terms of setting the direction of where we're going from here. So I've spent countless hours uh, talking with uh, students and staff and faculty at all of our campuses, uh, speaking with alumni groups, speaking with um, local and regional uh, leaders in the, in the areas where our campuses are located to, um, to try to make sure, again, that we're all rowing in the same direction. And I think we're, we're really making headway there. Um, so that, that's kind of, a, you know, and I was saying before the meeting started, if, if I had kind of a, a quick uh, description of what I, what I hope to see really emerging in this next year or so, it's, it's for our students and our faculty and our staff and our communities to really begin to see these, see how uh, we can retain the individual character and culture and even history of some of our individual campuses while seeing the benefits of, of being part of a larger um, institution and, and the resources that can come with that uh, on behalf of our students and I know you've met the the Chancellor I think I've got about a month and a half uh, head start on her so uh, Chancellor Malk who uh, has been great and uh, one thing that she and I share is that you know as we move things forward that always keeping you know what's in the best interest of our students as the driver in all of our planning efforts and if we do that I think we we, we really can't go wrong so um, so that's where we're at. I mean, we have we have work to be to, to do for sure, uh, no, no doubt about it. Uh, but I've really been heartened by the the response that um, I've received and had in those conversations. The, the support that I've felt across the state. I mean, has really been um, has really been affirming. And I'll share that just one last thing that even in my in my conversations that I've had um, on the campuses, I mean, people have felt very comfortable in sharing their concerns and their worries, you know, and, uh, but, you know, I, what, what, what I think really uh, resonated for me is that there's not resistance to change, um, there's not just resistance for the sake of resistance. I think, um, I think almost everyone I've spoken to has acknowledged that for VTSU to be successful, that change has to occur moving forward. It's just that they really want to be sure that there's inclusion uh, in those discussions and in, informing in uh, our direction and making sure we're tapping into our own internal expertise to the extent that we can in, in, uh, in those conversations. So, so that's what I'm, I'm committed to. And um, I said that was the last thing I'll say. I'll say, I'll say one last thing, which is that, um, you know, everyone on the campuses has experienced so much change so fast that uh, I keep saying, if nothing else, uh, what I want to offer in the short term, at least, is an opportunity for folks to catch their breath a little bit and, you know, understanding there's more work to do, more change to come. but to really uh, have us refocused on our work supporting students and uh, and to have that be the, the the primary focus of folks' times rather than, uh, you know, feeling like they're in constant response mode to, you know, the, the latest change to come down the pike. So um, so given all that, again, it's there's there's hard work to do, but I think we're, we're pointed in the right direction, and I've really been impressed by folks rallying to, to support that. Great. So. So it's so the two presidents, you and Joyce Judy, you yes. have all of the campuses that Judy basically doesn't, that uh, Joyce doesn't have, and then the chancellor oversees, the two of you report to the chancellor. Yeah, the two of us report to the chancellor, yes, okay. right, who is the direct, um, uh, direct conduit to the, our board of trustees. Okay. Yeah. And you've been able to get around to the, your campuses? Yes, yeah, so our campuses, just so everyone knows, at Williston, Randolph, Johnson, uh, Linden, and Castleton. So, so those Williston, tell me about Williston. Yeah, Williston is probably the least traditional of, uh -huh. of any of those. If folks have not, it's sort of, frankly, is a former kind of strip mall uh, set up. It's four buildings in a circle off of uh, the kind of heavily trafficked uh, area right there at the corners, right off of the interstate at, at, at Williston. And uh, that originally was uh, part of Vermont Tech, so it was affiliated with what's now our Randolph campus, and that's one of the places where, you know, a lot of our nursing programs and the like have have, uh, have operated out of. But uh, but there is a residential facility there as well, and you know that was kind of the last. I, I say that the campuses were originally positioned where they were, you know, to kind of represent underserved areas. Uh, those, the legacy institutions, as we refer to them, are sort of the other campuses. Williston is comparatively uh, newer. Questions? Two gentlemen represent Castleton. Okay. 
area. We were, a couple of us were up there this year in the fall, very impressive. I thought the students were, uh, speaking for myself, the students, the students we interacted with, I felt had been at a range of institutions in the United States, really talented, interesting great people. Here. So um, that seemed very positive, yeah. Is there a campus that has your concern, you know, that, that you have an eye on that, that, listen, we all have issues in our workplace, areas sure. that we feel are thriving, areas that we might want to improve upon. Can you say something about well, that? I would say that, the, you know, the-, the Not really fair, completely fair right, question, well, but anything you could- Yeah, no, it's a good question. I think that the issues and concerns are slightly different per campus, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they all, again, have their individual cultures and history. Uh, there's an interesting dynamic in which, so, a little bit of additional recent history, as some of you know, is that it was probably about seven years ago now that, that Johnson and Linden affiliated to become Northern Vermont University. So in some ways, they already kind of went through and have become expert in some of the growing pains that comes along with, with this sort of exercise. Mm -hmm. So so they're sort of in a different place on that than, say, Castleton, for example, uh, for, for whom some of these challenges they're experiencing for the first time. So. You know, I, I you know, in terms of the campuses themselves, and I'll just say that I think the next big, um, one of the next big initiatives that we're going to be looking at over a period of many years, um, and being very inclusive in this process, is looking at our physical uh, campuses and needs. And uh, the preliminary work on that, in terms of a master planning process, started before I arrived, and some of the initial work that they've done with uh, that we've done with the consultant indicates probably in total we're you know, somewhere around 30% overbuilt across all of our campuses in terms of physical um, uh, spaces. And so then the question becomes, okay, so um, how do we make these campuses the best they can be, a vibrant, um, effective spaces for, for students? Um, I mean, at the same time that we might be overbuilt, we know we need to invest in some of the spaces we have to improve them. And uh, so I think we're going to have really um, some exciting conversations, I think, with campus community members and regional planners and agencies and partners in, in the areas where we're located to talk about creative uses, potentially for, for space that we may not need. I mean, recognizing these campuses were, were built in a, in a different time uh, with different teaching and learning modalities and certainly with a different demographic uh, base. So, and I do want to say regarding Castleton, I, I've, I've really enjoyed, I've had the chance to connect with some of the uh, folks in the Rutland area. I had a, had a meeting at the, um, the hub space, the club space downtown, which is just a remarkable, yeah, Lyle Jepson. I met with, with him and representatives from the mayor's office there. And I think that uh, we see all kinds of ways to, I know that there's been such a strong partnership between the city of Rutland and Castleton University, and we don't want to lose that for sure. Yeah. Is there still a Castleton office downtown? Dorms. 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 Yeah. Dorms. Yeah. yeah, there's a, an art gallery, some um, uh, some residential space, yeah. yeah. It's an economic driver for, well, Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, when you came in, we were talking PCBs, we were talking school construction stuff in general. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of schools out there that are in rough shape physically, right? even put PCBs aside. Is there room, or I guess I would just say something to think about. I've always loved the partnership between secondary and post-secondary. Mm -hmm. you know, kids on college campuses, kids using college spaces for 9 through 12. You know, just you know, as you're sort of looking at spaces and talking to community members, right. for all we know, there could be a school right nearby that is in such that the physical plant, the only option is to raise it, and could they then have a, you know, if you're 30% overbuilt, you said, right, perhaps, right. is there those kinds of those, opportunities? Yes, Just yeah. something to think about. I yeah. think those are the kinds of opportunities that I'd be excited about. I mean, I when I talk about kind of the ideal for, so if we have spaces that, you know, aren't needed in their current fashion, you mm -hmm. know, are there local or regional agencies or organizations or schools that have space needs that might want to lease or rent space on the campus? And, and how perfect if that, if they, had a program or did work that connected with one of our academic programs, where yeah. then our students could intern right on, you know, at a campus location and kind of bring a class. vibrancy yeah. energy. Yeah. yeah. So, so those are the kind of things we, you know, obviously our student needs are going to be our driver, and uh, but you know how we can uh, look at community and regional needs in terms of addressing some of the, 
you know, spaces we might not need for our core functions in ways that are mutually beneficial. I mean, that, that's pretty exciting to me. I, I should note that when I was at Johnson uh, the last several years that I was there, I, I chaired the board of the, of the Regional Planning Commission there, the Lamoille mm -hmm. County Planning Commission. So this kind of um, intersection between, uh, you know, how, how these campuses can really truly be resources to the broader community is really important to me. Please. I want to echo what uh, Chair Campion said. Uh, Senator Weeks and I were on the School Construction Aid Task Force, and um, it was it just became clear the, the crushing uh, amount of money that it can accrue pretty quickly yeah. with um, buildings that are not kept up. So mm -hmm. I guess I would just um, hope that you would prioritize the the building um, the buildings and grounds and taking a close look and I know it's you don't want to rush into major changes right. as you said earlier which makes sense but um, and from my lived experience building a high school in Burlington mm -hmm. the, the construction costs just keep going up and up and up and yeah. I mean it's it's astounding so the sooner you can get on that the better yes. I yeah. highly <laughs> encourage you to do that um, and then I had a second question actually um, we do have a bill in this committee that you're probably aware of around the Board of Trustees, and mm -hmm. I know that you don't, um, it sounds like you don't report directly to the board, but Correct. do you have, a, do you have a, a comment or an opinion on the proposal? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, um, first I'll just be honest, that in the course of, you know, my, my focus has obviously been on these five campuses since I've been here, so it has, isn't something I've uh, had time to give a lot of uh, review or consideration to. I, I, believe that um, our, our board chair, Representative Dickinson, and I think the chancellor have, have yeah. testified on that. And so, uh, and a lot of it is our, our policy determinations to, to be made. I mean, uh, so, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I'll work with the board that we have to, to, to work with, I guess, is what I would say to that. Right. Yeah. right. I am sort of hearing what you're saying, though, in terms of consistency right now for the, for the, for the short term trying not to shake things up uh, as as there are so many changes already in the works. And so I'm, I, I'm hearing that and I appreciate that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Please. So how long do you plan to be around? Well, so I have an agreement. This is so usually this is our closer. <laughs> no, no, no. This is a, this is a question I've been fielding. Uh, so I mentioned I've been making the rounds. I met with the staff federation union He's group in Linden. And, 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 <laughs> I'll wait for this, a second. This, this is a, right. <laughs> um, well, part of that is, is out of my hands, I'll just say. So I, I agreed to come in and do this uh, on an interim basis. It's a different interim arrangement than the one that Mike Smith uh, had, right? So he came in, it was a very immediate need. So here's the quick version of, of kind of how I understand this, understanding again that I wasn't here for some of this, right? But there was a full national search conducted that brought in uh, to bring in the inaugural president of VTSU. And a full national search is time consuming and uh, uh, it's a lot of process and expense around that. And um, and unfortunately, that didn't last long term. And then, and I think with the departure of, of the initial president, uh, there was just a need for immediate, you know, fill in, which is what which Mike Smith uh, very admirably did. And uh, and I think that there had been a commitment, as I understand it, uh, at the time uh, to the faculty and staff that there would be the, the likelihood or of, of considering another full national search process, but that there just simply wasn't time to be doing that with all the things that needed to happen. In the in the immediate term, and so um, decided that a reasonable time frame to, to consider filling to enable a, another full search, if it was to be if that was to be what was to happen, would be through to get us through the 24-25 school year. So that's a long way. I apologize of saying that my contract takes me through the end of June 25. So it's a lot of time. I mean, it's it's for an interim contract. It's a, it's a you know. It's, it's enough time to really, I think, have an impact. Um, again, really kind of affect the impact, the culture. Um, and again, hopefully to, to help continue to build things forward and stabilize. And what I've committed to the um, to, to staff and faculty at the university, because their concern is, again, this is another area where there's been rapid change, you know, uh, leadership, and that, that can kind of feel disruptive and disorienting is, uh, uh, you know, whether or not, if, if it's not me, if I'm only doing this interim period, then what I've assured is that we're going to be 
moving things in a direction that will be consistent, that there will be a smooth transition to, to new leadership and uh, there won't be any kind of abrupt shift in, in, in focus at that point. So, um, but I have, I, just so you know, because I've been asked this, I, I've, I've, uh, sometimes interim contracts uh, preclude or prevent you from applying for it full time. There's nothing like that in my agreement. So conceivably, if, if uh, uh, you know, I was feeling it was going well and others were feeling it was going well, I could uh, conceivably throw my hat in the ring. And right now it depends on the day, quite honestly. Yeah. If I, <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Senator Gulick's point around stabilization is so key. And uh, there's been some instability. Yes. And listen, that, that kind of thing happens. It happens in all sorts of institutions across the United States. And so um, appreciate your stepping in and willing to do this and taking on such a long period of time. Thank you. If I could, so, sure. so thank you for coming in and testifying. It's, it's, uh, it's nice to meet you and we fully recognize that you've got a full plate um, already on hand. But I'm, I'm curious though, if, if you're thinking over the next roughly 18 months of your, mm -hmm. your initial tenure, uh, if you've created any Kind of goals for the first six months or 12 months or 18 months you know is there any like you know hot burning topics that are for at the forefront yeah well um really the biggest thing I've, I've kind of alluded to them a little bit already you know one is just kind of stabilizing i mean just to be honest i mean the, 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 things were so disrupted when i came in that i think you know just the need to to project and, and for folks to feel some consistency uh, and comfort in what they're doing, and uh, and uh, you know, and, and as I say, to, to start to really kind of appreciate and understand the benefits of being part of a larger university on each of the campuses, and I think we're really making headway. I mean, the feedback from faculty has been about how, how great the experience already has been with some of the uh, the mixed classroom experiences where you have students from 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 different uh, campuses. But I think the um, starting the this work around the physical campuses I do think is really kind of the next big thing uh, the, the, the the review of, of the physical plant the master planning and so my goal would really be to have that on a path forward I mean you know a lot of what that work will involve we won't see the fruits of for 10 to 15 years right and the world will be a very different place in 10 to 15 years I, I always say you know five years ago who would have predicted a you know a global pandemic so I think that what we can do is in the next few years, make some really smart decisions and position ourselves with these campuses so that we can be prepared to pivot in the direction that you know facts on the ground take us to between now and then. But I do think uh, positioning the work of the, of the master planning, um, bringing increased stability uh, to the campuses. I mean, again, what's amazing is you think about it, this is the first year still of this university. I think we've got some really exciting um, I mean, this is the first year really that, that we're seeing like the test run of the of the new name being out there. I mean, Vermont, the name Vermont has cachet and means something and, and, and our admissions folks are saying now on the on the national recruitment scale, like when they're in, in uh, Denver and Pittsburgh and in Texas, that they're seeing a lot of big uptick in out of state interest. And I think, you know, we don't have year over year data to compare yet uh, in terms of what the impact of, of this new entity will be, but I think it is going to generate um, uh, some attention for us, which is a real upside. And related to that, frankly, the other thing that we need to do is just stop shooting ourselves in the foot, <laughs> you know, around and, and having uh, controversy swirling around in the, in, the, in the heart of our admission cycles, which has really undercut uh, some of the efforts in recent years. And I think in that regard, we're in a, in a really good place because I think we, there is, I really do share a sense of commitment in our faculty and staff to kind of uh, doing everything we can together to advance the university. Thank you. Thank you. Challenging times, for sure. Yes. I've been at Bennington College 18 years. Mm -hmm. Demographic shifts, you know, all sorts of uh, issues related to costs, higher education, making certain that middle class kids, lower middle class kids, Pell Grant eligible kids can afford yes. higher education. It's, it's incredibly challenging. Uh, also given all of the costs that are associated with higher education, mm -hmm. hiring the best faculty you can possibly get, in addition to inflation and all the other you know, sort of struggles that we outlined, including, of course, that physical plan. So, yes. Glad you're there, and please, if there's anything we can do to be helpful, 
Um, I think we're all happy to, to chip in. I appreciate that, and I really thank you for this opportunity. And again, really, uh, we couldn't be doing this without the, the legislature's uh, support and the, the governor's support. So we're, we're uh, very appreciative of that. So thank you. Great. Thank yeah. you. Any final questions? Good. Terry, it's just, time. Just a couple. Here we go. I think, I think <laughs> you've seen the, the words behind this, for sure. Good. And you've yeah. got a commitment from faculty and staff, even students, to pull together to fix whatever you decide needs to be fixed. So, you know, if it's bad news, I think they can deal with it as long as they know it up front. Right. So, yeah. But appreciate what you're doing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very much so. Great. Thank you. Okay. And of course, you've got great people like Drake on your team. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> and uh, I think we'll leave it there. Great. great. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Drake, just so you know, uh, we have, you and the secretary will have a conversation, I'm sure, regarding uh, credits, section nine of the CTE bill. And so she's going to reach out to all of you and right. vice versa. Great. Hi. Hello. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you could see the back of my head this whole time, right? <laughs> Ms. Emerson. Yes. Please. And Scott and Melissa, you said that you, I'll let you all organize. How are you, Melissa? I was going to give you the nice chair. Oh, you were? Thank you. Come on up, Scott. We've done this as a group up for now in previous testimony, so we figured we'd stay with it. So. Terrific. And I do appreciate, usually we see Mr. Farr up in the upper right-hand corner, so appreciate you <laughs> coming here. It's first. school vacation week, and it's a sunny day. Why not? Great. It's well, not vacation week for me, because we do not have an online <laughs> calendar. Well, there's yeah. a yeah. 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 But in all seriousness, for you to come in on a school vacation week yeah. when you know we want faculty, staff, administration to take a break as much as they can, I really do appreciate it a lot to us as we're trying to work our way through this. So, thank, you. thank you. So what I think he's saying is that during a town meeting week, he's, always, he's uh, available yeah. for, for meetings at the CTA. Right, right. <laughs> we'll switch. No, right. We'll switch. Right. No, my understanding is he does attend uh, Southwest <laughs> yeah, yeah. quite frequently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so for the record, Please, I'm Scott yeah. Farr. I'm the superintendent director of the River Valley Technical Center School District in Springfield, Vermont, and the current president of the Tech Directors Association. And I'm Jody Emerson, uh, Superintendent Director of Central Vermont Career Center in Barrie, and apparently the incoming president of VAC-10. Congratulations. And I'm Melissa Kana, the Director of Stafford Technical Center in Rutland, and the very happy past president of VAC-10. <laughs> and the joke is, Melissa made me do it because we used to work together years ago. So um, we looked at the bill. It's changed a little bit since we started first looking at it, so we're going to try to adjust on the fly. We're also trying to match it up with some thoughtful asks that we would have based on the APA report that came out in uh, April. Mm -hmm. you know, we knew that there would be a dialogue around all of this and we wanted to make sure we had the input of all the technical center directors in the state. And we even crafted a couple of letters to put our point of view on, uh, of future conversations out. We're going to go back to that and I think you can see that in uh, the documentation that Jody um, shared with you. As far as governance, and it's not directly in this bill, we felt like we needed to at least have a reaction to it. Is governance should be done thoughtfully. We should have in mind that uh, the governance model should best serve the mission of career and technical education and our students is too important to rush, and we want to do it right. Okay. And we also recognize the bigger conversation of all the education system in the state of Vermont is going to happen over the next few years and that we want to make sure that we fit in nicely with wherever all of that goes and uh, we didn't want to be a, ahead of the curve uh, we want to make sure we fit very well in that and give an opportunity for the work that APA is doing that Melissa and I are participating on to, to play out a little bit as far as uh, the governance piece so uh, we do share the secretary's view on that when our conversation started talking about the funding of CTE, we could predict or see, well, it wasn't predict, but we could see that with the increase in healthcare costs, um, um, that the federal funds leaving mm -hmm. um, public ed, 
And then 127, we didn't see it at the time, but the transition in funding of uh, the rest of the system, we thought that this might be a good time, if we can, to move quickly to have a non-competitive funding system because our partners in, in the rest of the system are really going to feel it this year. And if we can move away to what APA has pointed out and we have said for well, at least a decade I've been involved, let's not put, pit us against the people that we share the students with so that we can best deliver on the mission. If we can get out in front of this, this may be a great time to do that. Mm -hmm. And our uh, original letter of ask back, to, back in November said, hey, if we could do this, it would be a really cool thing to do. Now we recognize that all of our budgets are well down the road and that probably isn't possible, but the thought was, the time it could be good to do something bold. And that ends my section in the first part. Okay. And so um, we wanted to address points two and three next. Um, the one in, in talking about requiring or providing access to grades six through eight with career centers. And, I think it's just so we just so we know you're referring to uh, the doc, the bill itself, three or four. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. And we went more with the, the starting bullets than digging deep into the language. We took a bigger picture view of it. Beautiful. So one of the things that um, and Interim Secretary Boucher kind of alluded to it earlier from some of the conversations we've had with her is that every tech center is very different. Um, I can speak you know, for myself here in, in Rutland region, we serve 34 middle schools. And for us to try to have every middle school student coming through um, our building would be a big ask. Um, it would be you know, hard on our instructors while we're also trying to do recruiting for um, our students that want to come here and pursue you know, two years here at Stafford. So what we would ask for in, in something like that is to really think about that flexibility. Um, I think many of us um, around the state have some really great models in place, and we would hate to lose some of that. Um, so while we think it's important that sixth or eighth graders get access, we do want to include that flexibility. The other piece, too, that we've, we've been talking about um, is really looking at we have several that are um, positions within CT that are required, and we would really like to see a middle school position required for every career and tech ed center um, with salary assistance similar to those other required positions. That would ensure that every middle school student around the state has equitable access to CTE and that there is a plan and there is somebody that that is their um, point and, and their purpose within the career and tech ed center. Um, when we talk about grades nine through 10, I'm sorry, Melissa. I'm sorry to interrupt your testimony. I think um, I'm curious about that uh, the, the second point on the uh, written testimony that we have because at least what I was thinking in my mind was you know there's that there, there, there would be you know an annual field trip essentially to the CTE. Are you seeing it more as creating more programs for grades six through eight? Is that how the language uh, would be interpreted by you folks? I think there needs to be flexibility about how that not necessarily, I don't think it necessarily has to be a visit. Um, you know, here at Stafford, we have a menu of offerings for all of our middle school partners and they look and they do what fits within their work of study, which fits within their budget as far as busing. Um, some of our you know, middle schools don't have the budget for field trips. And so we wanna make sure that we can meet their needs and we can still provide exposures. So it might be us going to them um, instead of them coming to us. And so just allowing that flexibility. And we have some middle schools that have literally 50 students and we have some that have close to 300. And so an experience looks very different between you know, 50 students and 300 students. Makes sense. Thanks. Well, Senator Weeks, you wanna jump in? Sure, just a question. So is your vision like, um, like, a, like a video, you know, like a production, something kind of like, like some type of audio visual, here's an introduction as, a, as an option to a site visit? I think that could be an option. Um, I think in many cases, um, tech centers are going to the middle schools and bringing students to the middle school students, bringing actual activities for them to do to give them exposures. Um, we have a stepped approach and I know many other tech centers do. We wanna make sure that every time that they have an interaction with us, it's a new and different experience so that as a sixth grader, they're not getting the same thing as a 10th grade visit um, to our school. 
So I think every tech center does it a little bit differently. I think we're hitting our middle schools, um, but it's what works best for our middle school partners um, and works best for the size of our center and the staffing within our centers. And so I would hate to have a mandate for a smaller center that just simply doesn't have the staffing in order to do that. Thank you. This would help us at Central Vermont to expand what we do with our, our sending schools, middle schools. Right now we do have a, a school counseling coordinator who visits each middle school and makes presentations, brings tools from those programs. And then all of our eighth graders do visit us annually. To ask us to have the sixth and seventh and eighth all visit us wouldn't be feasible. And I heard the interim secretary say that's not what they anticipated. But looking at kind of what Melissa just said, a step model of in sixth grade we do this, in seventh grade we do this, and in eighth grade we do this based on each center and their sending schools relationships. I think that's important. Yeah, I'll quickly add that actually <clears throat> I view this one section as kind of limiting. There's a lot more already happening as far as middle school outreach. We all have a package of five or six different things um, that we do. Um, many of us have been doing it for many years and we've been doing it with grant funding. I think it's important enough uh, that it just becomes part of what we do and that there's a person that is designated to do that, to be an ambassador or liaison with our partner schools to set up a program that makes the most um, sense. And there's a lot of really cool things happening. I know we don't have time, but to, to hear what different centers are doing to introduce ourselves to middle schoolers, it, it, one visit, there's way more happening than that already. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the position that you'd like, it sounds like you'd like to add a, a position in, in uh, CTE to be a middle school liaison. Does that, does that require legislation, do you think, or is that just something that will be incorporated into budgets? Or I, I think that there are a handful of positions that are required positions within career and technical education, directors, uh, school counselors, uh, co-op coordinators. Those are all partially funded or by the state as a funding stream for the Ed Fund, that it's important enough that that should get that level of recognition as far as the work. You know, if you look at the co-op position, that's really transitioning students out. Well, we should have a position that helps transition uh, students in and, and, and make sure there's a solid level of experiences that move them from career awareness, exploration, and really to career development, which what happens at, at the tech center. So. That would be our recommendation. So yeah, so yes, it would require legislation. Yeah. Okay. And my other question, sorry to go, go backwards, but to the um, funding piece, number one. So were you in agreement with the interim secretary's proposal? Is that yeah. what I heard? It's changed a little bit. So uh, it, when she opened, she was talking about a going back to a single year FTE model. Now that's transitioned to. Uh, an interim kind of way of funding that sounds like it would work. We'd like to see what the secretary presents next week, but it sounds like we're going to keep it whole with a chance to move where there, an increase where is necessary. That sounds really good, but administrators who are conscious of the bottom line, what does that really mean to us in the end? But it sounds good at this moment, sure. Is it non competitive? Yeah. How does it, we don't know how it impacts. Right. Our sending schools and us yet. Right. So, so well, we like have the secretary here. Can you sorry? Can you say is it? Are you thinking competitive grants? You're just no. No. Okay. So I think I think Jody as far as the different. tuitioning of students, like when I think about the what we were asking for a non-competitive, our sending schools right now get some portion of their students' tuition, and we get some directly, and then we bill them for a portion still. And so it's a disincentive for them to send kids to us if they really need those funds, right? And so how does this impact them? I don't know that we know that yet. So my understanding um, is that, so my understanding is that there's a base appropriation that's given to the LEAs, but it's really on that. You know, it's given, it's, it's given to the CTEs and it's given to the LEAs for CTEs that are not um, independent, like right, the two of you. But my understanding is that then there's a direct tuition model back to the LEAs, and so our, that, that they pay out of their budget. And so I'm not seeing where there's a loss for the LEAs. Like, to me, it's just 
we're taking the money that already would be going through those that it goes through and actually giving it more directly to the CTEs. Yeah, our, our hope would be that they don't even, it's not in their books at all, that you yeah. send That's as many kids as that you want and there's no direct impact, particularly for a small school, it can serve as a disincentive. That's been a decade of conversation and send them, you don't even see it in your books. Send us five more, you don't even see it in your books. That's what we would hope we would all along have moved to. And I apologize to interview with I interrupted that you were midway through. Uh, <coughs> I think that was, I think you just answered it. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, that's helpful. Hey, um, item number three, requiring school district to provide students enrolled in grades nine and 10, a genuine opportunity to participate in pre-tech and exploratory career and technical courses. One of the questions we had is, you know, what really is a genuine opportunity? Um, that was a little um, ambiguous to us. And, and for us, you know, some of the, the challenges when we have pre-tech exploratory programs, which are really just kind of introductory courses to our programming, for a full day center, um, like many of us are around the state, we have OSHA limits for the number of students that we can have in hard laps. Um, so for us in, to be able to have pre-tech exploratory um, programs, we can't have them in the labs because our labs are full with students already and we would be violating OSHA rights. So it really comes down to some challenges around some of the pre-tech exploratories around space, um, having space to be able to have them, having the staffing. And then because they are um, short introductory courses, when I have um, a, a partner school that's perhaps 45 minutes away, does it make sense for them to be able to come here um, to Stafford for a 70 minute class and then return on a 40 minute bus ride? Um, in turn, us going out for satellite programs, um, while it's been done, it is another challenge because again, it's additional staffing that we have to have and it's hard enough to get staffing for our regular programs. Um, there's additional costs and also ensuring that any of the spaces that we're going to be working with meet the requirements for CTE in terms of safety uh, around different equipment. So that's a challenge for us. We definitely are in favor of doing it. I think we've just got to think kind of outside of the box on how can we make that happen in a way that's not a burden to the current system and is a good quality experience for our students. And I think it's still me. Yeah. Um, so the other one around um, requiring the agency of education to create a super, uh, create supervisory unions to adopt a model of comprehensive career development um, policy. This is one of the areas that we really feel that we would love to see it worded in a way that it's a partnership between us and our regional high schools within our regional district. Um, you know, there's several reasons for this. One, obviously to be able to do a lot of this middle school work that we're talking about, um, that would make it helpful. But it also gets into the areas of um, high school graduation requirements. Um, I've said this to this committee before, um, so I, I apologize if I sound like a broken record, but when you're dealing with anywhere from 10 to 11 high schools that all have different graduation requirements, that makes it a challenge for us to be able to meet all of those needs of all of those different high schools, as well as giving them the technical education. The Vermont Agency of Education has worked with all of our instructors to identify embedded academic credits within each of our technical programs. And we would like to see those um, mandated to have to be recognized by our partner high schools for more than just English and math elective credits. Um, the example I'd love to give is our engineering program. The science curriculum that they do is a physics class. They are studying physics as part of that. And when it goes on most high school transcripts for that science credit that's embedded, it's listed as an elective science credit. So when that student is going on to apply for post-secondary, an elective science credit doesn't look as enticing to an admissions counselor as a physics credit. Um, so that's something that we feel is really important. And we think by having a career development um, partnership with our partner high schools, that could help us have some consistency and some clarity so that students around the state are getting credit for the work that they're actually doing in their technical programs. Well, so that, that was a question I've had. I've been waiting for the right opportunity. Uh, I have personal experience with guidance counselor that had uh, students that were on a college track, and then you know all the cool kids were going to to Voltech to do the you know the 
things that they wanted to do. They wanted to change their career field, their career path midstream and, and got some resistance from the guidance. How do we get around that? Is there, do you, have you experienced that? Mm -hmm. So we do, um, as part of our comprehensive le local needs assessment that is part of our Perkins plan, one of the questions we ask our students in our survey is whether or not anyone discouraged them to apply to tech centers. Um, and we had this year about 10% of our current students, um, so that's just under 30 students, that said that they were discouraged. And about half of those were discouraged by school counselors. Um, they're able to put comments, and one said that their counselor said they were not dumb enough to come to a tech center. Um, that's disheartening that that is still existing. I will say it's gone down. Last year we were at 17%, we're at 10% now, so we're making gains. But the, the stigma that still is out there, um, it's disheartening. Ms. Connor, can you say something about the other, uh, where some of the other discouragement came from? Or is it just so, such a mix? For me, it's parents. Um, a lot of it was parents, exactly. Um, parents discouraging, um, peers not wanting their friends to leave. Um, but, you know, I would say the majority out of those that were discouraged, it was through school counselors. And I think wow. in a lot of cases, it's they don't understand um, yeah. because they never experienced career in tech ed. They went through the traditional school pathway. Um, so I think it's, you know, making more awareness. And I think with a career development um, partnership between tech centers and um, the supervisory unions, we could improve that. Yeah, thank you. I just realized that my piece of this is the same as what Melissa just shared with you. So good job, Melissa. We got that covered. <laughs> <laughs> and you can cross that part out. Um, I do. I will add that um, one of our colleagues uh, indicated that he wants someone to bring up the fact that we do take adult students who have diplomas. For example, in my program, I have cosmetology for two years. And so a lot of times the second year cosmetology students may be adult students and we can only charge 40% of our tuition for those students. And so that also is not helpful in keeping our programs alive. So it's it's one area that that individual wanted us to bring up in our testimony today. So I just wanted to, to share that with you quickly. So where does the remaining 60% go from? Just, it, we, just absorb it? We absorb it, yep. Mm -hmm. Just like we do any other changes and shifts, and we could have in any year our six semester average could be greater than or less than the number of students we have in the building. Yeah. Um, oversight of CTE by the State Board of Education to the Secretary of Education. I think our comment would be the rules that, that govern us are over 20 years old and we would welcome a change in those rules. Um, so, so the system it kind of is to where we are now versus where it was 25 years ago. As far as who makes those rules changes and who has the authority to do that, I, I'm not sure how that happens in state government. Is it, who is it? Well, we should do that then. Whoever usually does that, they should do it again and, and change it after 20, 20 years of one way, so. Um, we would love for it to be collaborative. Yes. Yes. What was it? Think it wasn't 20 years ago? Sorry. No idea. Who knows? No, I mean, you, were, you were teenagers, or you were not even. You were well, appreciate little... that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like a shift from a state board to uh, the secretary position. It could go at the whim of whoever's in that role. I don't know that it would, but it feels like it could. So it, as long as that we are consulted or at least brought in. Um, and that there's recognition. I think the AOE has clear recognition of what is required of us for our Perkins, for example, which is really high stringent accountability data and information. So I think they would be, but it's a concern. Yeah. That's a really good yeah. yeah. Oh, yes, please, Secretary for share. Hi, sorry. One way to, I think, counter that, which I think is unreasonable, the piece about the shifting, is mm -hmm. the, the statute could require um, the agency to actually um, engage in rulemaking every six years or you know like, so that would actually protect against some of that variability um, of it being an agency i also just wanted to remind so baked into rulemaking it has to be collaborative that's the whole reason 
good. Like you, there has to be public comment. There has to be a lot of opportunities for the public, um, including obviously the CTD centers themselves, to weigh in on that. Great. Um, number six, um, and this is the one around requiring the state colleges um, to have articulation agreements with our CTE centers. And um, Jody kind of alluded to the fact that we have very stringent federal accountability measures for our students and our centers. One of them being that we have to actually offer dual enrollment credits, which is different than articulations. Um, and so an articulation agreement is basically a student is doing college level work at their uh, tech center. But the only way they actually get that college credit transcripted is if they actually attend that institution. Um, whereas dual enrollment, which is what our federal requirement is, is that we have faculty on site teaching those college level courses and the college credit is actually transcripted with whichever um, institution that instructor is actually working with as an adjunct professor. Um, and so that provides portability. And while I understand um, there's probably a desire um, to have our students continue on at Vermont institutions, for some of the programs, that's just not an option. So when we think of culinary, right now there is not a culinary institute in the state of Vermont for our students to take part in. Um, and you know some of the other programs, there's specialty areas that they might not be able to find at a Vermont institution that they would wanna go out, outside of the state for, and they would want to be able to take those college credits that they earned. So that is one thing. And in the packet, um, in our testimony, we provided, these are the requirements that we have for all of our programs um, going forward for next year. And each year they will increase. Um, and this is again, federal requirements that we are provided measures on and we have to address in our Perkins plan. Um, and if we don't meet our targets, we have to take 30% of our funding and address it to fix that. Um, and so we have several programs um, starting next year that are going to require at least six transcripted credits or a combination of three transcripted credits and an IRC. So for us, it's really important that when we're looking at this, if possible, that it could be um, rather than an articulation, a dual enrollment agreement so that we can be working with our state partners um, at the post-secondary level while also meeting our post-secondary um, agreements. So that is one of the things. And then for seven, which is the school construction and facilities construction, yes, please keep keep us in there and keep us in mind. We definitely have facilities that need work. And as you've heard me say more than once, I do not have enough space in the facility that I'm in. My board just signed on agreement with two architects together, the ones that are working up at Burlington as well. Um, and we're looking to a 2029 new building. So. There is work in progress and we're gonna need some funding, so please don't forget us there. <laughs> and I know, Melissa, you're gonna need some too. Absolutely. So not only are we expanding, um, we've doubled th the capacity of three programs. Um, they're not in the most ideal spaces. Um, we've converted traditional classroom spaces to hard labs, um, which is not ideal, um, but we're making it work. And we also have some of our outbuildings, which were original in 1974, that have seen better days. Um, that we're actually working on a study right now. We're meeting with architects next week about um, rehabbing those buildings or replacing those buildings to find out the cost of those. And I'll chime in quickly. My center doesn't need, we're new. We're less than 20 years old and it was part of an effort in late 90s, early 2000s that had a plan. You, they evaluated the sites, which, which region should get a new, new tech center, uh, Southwest in Bennington, uh, River Valley and Springfield, Newport, uh, Green Mountain and Hyde Park. Uh, am I missing anybody? I think Hannaford had a recent yeah, and new building. Yeah, so there was a plan before that is very similar to what is happening now and looking at all, this, uh, all the buildings and then it all stopped when it all stopped for everybody. So we just want to make sure that we're in the conversation. And if we're providing some genuine access for earlier years, ninth and 10th grade, we're going to need more space for that too. Yeah, please okay, go ahead. Well, I'm just looking at graduation rates in some of certain districts here. So in Springfield, there is a tech center. Yes. Okay. So I, I, I mean, graduation rate, 68%. You know, love to get more kids engaged in tech if that will, you know, number one, if it's, of course, what they want to do, but also if um, keep them in school for a longer period. Yeah, you make a good point. I, I, 
the latest data from the last year is yeah. just coming out today, but I think we were at 90, 94, 95% in the last round for students that attend River Valley. As far as if they were specifically Springfield, yeah. I couldn't tell you. Okay. Uh, please, oh, sorry, Springfield. Thank you. Thank you. Um, declining enrollment across the state, which is probably going to continue even if we bring more people into the state. Mm -hmm. um, I assume as you're looking at plans for construction and growth that you're looking to take over possibly empty spaces in the, in the traditional high school because I would is that is it a shift going from traditional to CTE or what's happening? our lab spaces are cannot take place in traditional classrooms so that it would be probably more costly to transition traditional classrooms into CTE lab spaces mm -hmm. okay we're not necessarily looking at that but as we move into this site selection phase, I know that there are a couple of my sending school high schools that may have interest in our building near them or on their campus. So there may be a, a campus that has quite a bit of land and they could expand and then we could share the academic pieces and build our, our workshops there. Okay. I think the other data that is that the, the reduction of student enrollments as far as as high schools and regular school districts isn't totally reflected in what happens in CTE that CTE is kind of state level or increased and I think some of it is what was talked about in the committee is that it's some more, more students are considering that that's a way you know, that they should go I think it helps with dual enrollment and all the certifications take some of that stigma away and more students are seeing that as a pathway so We've stayed level, I believe, is what the data would show as a, as a, as a CTE, system in the, CTE system in the state of Vermont. Right. My applications have grown every year. Yeah, yeah. Okay. last year you said. Which is awesome. Yeah. I was just yeah. thinking more in terms of actual physical space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you were here when we had the president of you know, State University. Yeah. Again, locations, you know, if there's any way to partner with. I'd say our state universities. We're talking about the credit piece, but also maybe facilities. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, we're, we have the Howard Dean Education Center on our campus, which used to have five or six college classrooms. Well, nobody really takes a class in person these days, so we've moved that to early ed and child care. Four classrooms of that on the fourth floor because there's a local need for that, and it's a lab for our students in human services program. So we transition that based on the need that we had in, in our region. Um, May I ask, where would the new students be able to go if they wanted this kind of CTE experience? Winooski students? Yeah. Is there a career technical institute? Oh, okay. that, I, I presume I go to Essex, Essex or Burlington. They would go to Essex or Burlington. Okay. And is there an opportunity for kids in Essex North? Just again, looking at graduation rates. Yes. Essex or Burlington. That's also Essex okay. North. That's but they don't have the, yeah, but they yeah. don't have the full range of okay. programs, so they have some okay. limited programs up there. They have tried to do some cross-state work yep. in New Hampshire, but that has kind of fallen apart. But they're they're on our radar. They're always on Essex our radar. County. Right. And the, Sorry. And the other, okay. just to tag in quickly on the construction piece, the ratio of students available to the size, the number of spots available at the tech center. Um, Jody Center is 1960. Yeah. Yeah, and what has happened to the population in this region, there's been a shift in that some of the tech centers were built at a time when there was less students. We should consider we need more capacity just because the demographics have grown in that region. So we're going to take you down a slightly different path. Um, so uh, you started the conversation with um, kind of the remarkable difference between CTE graduation rates versus traditional high school graduation rates. You also had the comment that um, that you're always, I guess, mostly receiving more applications than you have spaces for. And I'm not sure if that's, I, I know it's true at Stafford, but, but my, my question is um, for the, for the a cadre of students that uh, apply but don't get in. Uh, is there any figure about the graduation rate of that cohort? Like, do they tend to become demotivated and say, well, heck with it. I'm not in a traditional high school path. Can't get into the CTE. 
come out of here? I, I don't have that hard data from my sending schools, and probably some that. of them are yeah. like that. Yeah, okay. Because I'd be curious if, you know, that's, if, if there was like this, um, uh, you know, if there was data that showed that, it would be great ammunition for you to say, hey, look, we really do need more seats because we're losing kids, and um, uh, we're not, we're not going to, we'll regain them maybe when they pop back up after getting tired of working at McDonald's, but uh, for adult education, but that's it. I think one of the things that was proposed in the agency's latest paper that I think was presented last week is more flexibility about accessing a different service region when the programming isn't available in your service region. And we work pretty closely uh, with Hartford, who is to the north of us. Hey, I got a kid that needs carpentry. Can they come to your center? Do you have a spot? I think. The agency is looking at a way to make that a little easier to do. How, how do we look at transportation to do that? Because right now, if that Harper student, that Harper student has to figure out how to come to Springfield to get the training that they want. So I, I thought you were raising your hand out of the corner of my eye. So I think we can do that with the rulemaking. Yeah. Yeah. In the same way that we have um, designated more than 20 years ago uh, the CTE uh, regions, that's a, that's a piece that could go into the rulemaking to actually craft those rules around like what to do in those situations and allow that permeability. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking primarily, this probably go with Melissa, and I really don't know what I'm talking about, but you know, right now this, the, the mayor of the city of Rutland have an ad, ad hoc working group, they need housing. And if, do you, have you got a plan to tie in with the, uh, the Reddick or the uh, people that you know, you, they can't find enough people. Absolutely. We actually, yeah, yeah, our, our construction technology, technology program advisory met, met probably about probably three or four, four, four weeks ago, ago uh, with, with Mayor Dungeon. Um, and um, we're actually coming up here again in a week to talk about the housing development that we're looking at, the building of housing in Rutland, and what role staff are going to play in that for both our construction students and our own plumbing students. Yeah, and we're going to have our natural resource forestry students to do the landscaping in the area of the So we are definitely in okay, so how about, uh, you know, the Vermont National Guard, they had uh, probably 25 years ago, now they had a problem with uh, called civilian acquired skills. Mm -hmm. So that if a, if a uh, M-Day soldier had a civilian acquired skill, it would fit into his military. They kind of they, they built a curriculum or curricula around that uh, so that you got credit for it. Is that something you have you have a curriculum that's been dictated or can you build one? We have we the have NCCR, NCCR curriculum, curriculum um, that, that is, is for several of our programs. programs. So, 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 so construction is a core curriculum, which is kind of like basic, basic safety, safety and tools. Um, and, um, then and then there's then instruction, level level one instruction, level two instruction, instruction curriculum. curriculum. That is that something that's prescripted by the state that we use in our construction, our electrical plumbing, HVAC, and well programs. Those are the ones that I'm going to think of the other that's all of them. Is there any way that any of those could be applied towards like post-secondary uh, requirements for enrollment or for credit, like college credit? At this At time, this I don't think there's any set agreements. Set um, I, know I know that we've had, had preliminary conversations, conversations before the, the, the merger, merger of the state, state college system, system with BCC in the construction, the construction management program, program. Uh, but then um, the merger, the merger was, happening, was happening, so things, things kind of paused. paused. Yeah. Um, so, um, so I think I that's think definitely something that we're super to pursue. I guess the reason I'm asking is because you guys are doing the right things and we need what you produce. So, yeah. but there may be a 10 year period when that shifts and we don't need as many. So right. I'd like to see something get off the ground because you, you guys are providing it. Absolutely. Yeah. Melissa, you get to talk about calendar. We want to take a ride. I know, I'm waiting for all the eye yeah. rolls and people to walk out of the room. <laughs> they always give me this one. Um, but, you know, the, the need is genuine for a statewide calendar, particularly around professional development for our career and tech ed instructors. Um, if you think of a traditional high school, they have departments and they have, you know, three or four English teachers or three or four math teachers or whatever the size of their faculty. For us, our instructors are the sole person in their department. And so for them to be able to really 
um, work together and network and be able to learn from one another, it's really challenging. And what happens now is we have we hire a consultant to do professional development for us statewide, um, and then they pick you know a couple of days during the school year, which means that we could have potentially four to five teachers out on a school day when students are in session. We have to struggle to get guest teachers. Um, I I think I could probably speak for Scott and Jody. Um, we have we as directors have been subbing in classrooms because we are short subs so that we can ensure that our teachers go to these professional de development opportunities. What we would love, and you know, even if we could baby step this in, um, you know, have four um, guaranteed professional development days for all career and tech ed instructors. Now that's a challenge with the different bargaining units when we have. Um, so many different unions around and everything um, is different depending on which district you're in, but that would really be helpful. Also looking at aligning some of the vacations, um, Scott and Jody, um, or Scott particularly can speak to this better than I, but we have many students and I experienced it as a teacher when I was in Springfield. Um, many students, if the vacations don't align, they sometimes don't get a vacation. Um, because they're in session at their partner high school and then the tech center is in session the following week. So those students never actually get a break. And it's also challenging, Scott and I experienced it this year, we share um, Mount Holly and we have, um, you know, his school would be on vacation and he has staff there. Mount Holly Elementary is part aligns with my calendar. And so their kids were off and his teachers were working. So there's lots of challenges for parents, for students and for educators to have that. Um, and I think those were the key points. Um, and, you know, and I think when we were talking about, there was a mention of a bell schedule. Um, I've been working, this is my ninth year at Stafford and it's taken me nine years to get all but one of my partner high schools on the same arrival and departure time. I still have one school that's on the outlier, but it, it's obviously it impacts the time that students spend in their program and in their academics in a full day center but it also impacts the experiences that students have to be able to connect with their at, back at their partner high school with athletics, with arts, uh, with clubs that they wanna participate in. Because one of the things that we always, um, I, I think we all tech centers do a really good job of is making sure that the opportunities for students back at their partner high school still exist for them so that they are feeling part of that school community as well. Um, and sometimes when we have varied bus schedules and departure times, it impacts whether they can make it back in time for practice. Um, and so we wanna just make sure that our students are able to have a set arrival and departure time that's gonna ensure them opportunities back at their partner high school as well. The, the calendar piece is it's bigger than just what happens in the school where families are split, teachers go to different sure. districts yeah. and it's childcare, it is, much as we want to think about our school district does it this week, what, what is the impact on our larger um, communities? One of the unintended consequences of Act 46 going a few years ago is that Mount Holly got a little bit of more choice mm -hmm. and their dance par partner is in a different technical center service region. So we work hard to coordinate around our region, but then some of those bordering towns, it's different. In Vermont, there are three different school vacation weeks in April, I think there's two. Okay. Now it really, yeah. and somebody in the, when we were testifying to house education, they were talking about what a challenge was, and I go, well, I think I remember we used to bargain healthcare individually, but we don't do that anymore either. So really, we should be able yeah. to figure this one out. And we're already required to have 171 days all of our sending schools in common with their CTE, their regional CTE. So 171 of the 175 already need to be in common. So if CTEs just align their schedule, that would force everybody else to align their schedule. So That's some of this, yes, it will have to be taken up in the house. I mean, we are getting close to crossover, as you know, but when it comes back to us, you know, we can add, we can continue these conversations, but we're gonna do our best between next week and the following week yeah. to, to move this. I would like to just go back to Senator Week's point. If there is any way to track students, how many students did you not accept last year? 200. 200. And, you know, we have 17% I can, I can on average of our Vermont students are not graduating from high school or dropping out, but we have them as, you know, some schools 50%. 
So if we can track those and help these kids get excited and uh, about education, it would be terrific. Yeah, I'll see what I can find out. I, you know, I realize it's, 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 it's a heavy lift. I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. I would assume, though, that if I was a CTE and I didn't accept a cadre of students, they kind of drop off the CTE's radar. And they go back to the, you know, right. to the home school. Yeah. Not home school, but to the sending school, yeah. right? And at that point, it's their data management, not, not the right. same. Right. But if you I were can to, ask for it. Yeah, if you were to ask them, hey, these are the 200 students yeah. that didn't get, you know, weren't accepted last year, and where are they now? You know, that kind of stuff really... Mm -hmm. Very compelling. Yeah. Very compelling. Yeah, please. Just uh, one question, something you, I think you had said uh, about um, the unions gave feedback on the common calendar. Uh, some of it wasn't positive, but there was some resistance. Somebody, maybe, anyway, somebody. Well, I, you know, you're talking about health care. We, so we testified in house education. And our, one of our asks have been for years to have okay. a common uh, calendar and the committee said, well, we, that may be more of a challenge than you think, and that's when I, I said, well. But too much mentioned the unions have resistance. Well, yeah, there's, there's language in that uh, the union has yeah. can weigh in differently on different in different places, yes. Yeah. For the number of days. So, for instance, we have 180 student days. And so across all our sending school districts, they might have different variants. Yeah, you don't need to get into that detail. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's the one. Yeah, right. And then when you get literal thinking about the bell schedule thing, like you can't actually actually have the same bell schedule okay, because the bus. Hang on, you don't need to go that. <laughs> the question is very simple. Which unions? Okay. The teachers union. Teachers union. Yes. Yeah. And okay, they're so all negotiating. Let's be more specific. It's you know for no state. We're trying. You know, we're trying to like I think uh, understand what the yeah. speed bumps are between here and voting out this legislation. Yeah. NEA. Potentially, yes. Okay, that's fair. I'm just curious, okay. like, who should we have testify, right? Mm -hmm. to, who, who is resistive of the idea? If right. we identify that, that's half the battle. Then we can have a conversation. Okay. Yeah. We have a long afternoon still ahead of us. Any final comments? Uh, I just say thank you. I yes, thank met you. with this committee over the years, and it's, it seems like things are gaining momentum to some changes so we can do absolutely the most we can for mm -hmm. our state works. Secretary asked us about what we were excited about, and we're excited that maybe some changes can happen to help us be even more effective than we already are. Great. And I think I'm back Tuesday You're anyway, back Tuesday. so maybe you have questions. Yeah. Yeah. Or an easy tour. Yeah. <laughs> I have um, the data from the state for my center, because it came through today oh. before I left. And so you can take a look at what information we get back from the agency around our accountability. Um, the first, very first one is our graduation rate. Mm -hmm. So mine is 96.47, which is pretty good. Thank like um, So this is the kind of data that all of the CTEs get. Mm -hmm. So if you want more of that information, you can. And you have one copy there for us? I just have yeah, one I'll copy. Look, we'll so. have I have to put it aside. <laughs> 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 Give it to uh, you. So we'll take five minutes. <laughs> Welcome back to Senate Education this Friday afternoon, 3.30, right on time. Uh, I want to thank Senator Sheen for bringing us back to S120, which is something we worked on last year. There was a study committee. Uh, I know that we have Representative Rachelson here. There's a companion bill in the House regarding some of this. But I want to turn it over to Senator Sheen and sure. tee this up a little bit more for us. Sure. Thanks. Thanks. So as the chair mentioned, this was something that we worked on last year. Uh, we got testimony on it and came to the conclusion that we should continue uh, studying it over the summer and the Intercollegiate Sexual Harm Prevention Council did a lot of work over the summer uh, including with different subcommittees to to put together some more language put together some proposed edits and come back uh, with something that hopefully uh, reaches some sort of consensus and that's what we'll find out today so I think that yeah, I wanted to you know make sure that we revisit this bill. That way, the work that we did last year and the work that was done over the summer isn't uh, lost. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. I think with that, it would be best to pass it to the uh, folks who did the work over the summer, and right. then. You know, and that would be more start with or uh, Beth. Sorry, Ms. Robinson, I believe. Or no, Beth. I, 
about St. James Office of the Legislative Council, I'm happy to do a, a very high level walkthrough for you, but I suspect that the folks who have done all of the hard work are going to do that okay. anyway. Yeah. So whatever, I'm just mindful of time and everyone's, you got a lot of people in the room who know more about this than me, mm -hmm. but I'm happy. Yeah, okay. Okay. okay, absolutely. Thank you. And Ms. Robinson. Thank you. Great to see you. Good to see you all. How are you? It's always good. It's always nice to have the the last the last thing you do on a Friday. So That's thank you for your staff. patience, yeah, and for um, for your time today. And thank you so much for returning to S120. Just a quick reminder, because I don't think I've been in here yet this session, uh, the Vermont Network is the leading statewide voice on issues related to domestic and sexual violence, and we represent 15 independent nonprofit organizations who provide services to victims of domestic and sexual violence across the state. And in 2023, those member organizations answered 23,300 hotline calls from individuals here in Vermont seeking support and provided in-person advocacy to 8,494 victims and survivors. 23,000 calls. 23,000 calls last year, yeah. And that um, has increased over the past several years as well. Uh, for too many students in Vermont, their time in college also includes experiences of sexual assault or sexual harm. Women who are ages 18 to 24 are four times more likely than women of other ages to experience sexual violence. And the impacts of sexual assault on college campuses are disproportionate to other kinds of victimization. For example, um, an individual is twice as likely to be sexually assaulted on a college campus than robbed. For these student survivors, sexual violence that's experienced in college has detrimental and material impacts on their education, on their future earnings, their overall health and well-being. And despite the prevalence of campus sexual violence, only a very small number, estimated at less than 10%, of these cases are reported at all. And a smaller number still wind their way through campus judicial processes or through criminal prosecution. Um, and Vermont's not immune to these national trends and statistics. It was only 2021 when hundreds of students walked out in protest over campus handling of sexual assault at Vermont's largest public university. So it's um, definitely an issue that is top of mind for many college students across Vermont. So your committee took up S120 last year and there was significant stakeholder input from various stakeholders and educational institutions regarding the bill as introduced. And after the legislative session, or the concerns that were raised during the legislative session, the Intercollegiate Sexual Harm Prevention Council worked to address many of the concerns that were raised in testimony and to work together on proposals to move the bill forward. Um, this included several subcommittees that met monthly throughout the summer and fall and provided language proposals, as well as many opportunities for input and feedback. At the December meeting of the Intercollegiate Sexual Harm Prevention Council, the council walked through these revisions section by section, and these proposed changes were supported by almost every stakeholder on the council, um, with the exception of the University of Vermont, who you'll hear from uh, later today. These changes are intended to create a framework for a consistent response to campus sexual harm while offering generous operational flexibility to institutions to implement the law. Um, as the basis of my testimony today, I would just like to walk through the progress that was made by the council over the summer and fall and the most substantive changes to the bill as introduced um, that resulted from this work. And I've provided some detailed proposals um, for amendments to Senator Hashim, um, but we'll walk through these changes at a slightly higher level um, today just for the purposes of testimony and would be happy to talk about those in greater depth. Um, so section one of the bill as introduced was about a sexual misconduct climate, uh, campus climate survey. And while the network, uh, who I represent, continues to remain strongly supportive of a shared campus climate survey, there was not stakeholder consensus or agreement on a shared um, climate survey. So our suggestion would be removing section one of the bill at this time, um, and we would continue to work with the Intercollegiate Sexual Harm Prevention Council to ensure that campuses are conducting uh, climate surveys 
And there's also the potential that some upcoming new Title IX um, administrative rules, which should be coming down federally in the coming months, may also be relevant um, to, the, to the kind of campus climate survey discussion. Section two is about resource advisors on college campuses. In this section of the bill, um, the changes that the Intercollegiate Council worked on and that we would propose replace the term resource advisors with advocacy coordinators throughout the section. We also propose to only require that an advocacy coordinator is available at institutions of higher education with 1,000 or more full-time residential students. And this change was meant to address any burdens that could be experienced by smaller or non-residential institutions. Um, in addition, we are proposing to remove some of the specified requirements for these positions and remove the confidentiality privilege um, for these positions that was originally proposed in the uh, bill as introduced. Section three is around memorandums of understanding between uh, institutions of higher education and community-based sexual assault programs. Um, we do not offer any proposed changes to section three of the bill. This is one item of significant importance, um, and in part, that's because community-based sexual assault advocates enjoy crisis worker privilege, which is um, found in Vermont statute, and allows them to offer confidential support and advocacy with protections um, from various requests or protections from subpoena. And it's essential that these partnerships exist so that students who experience sexual harm can access support on campus but can also access confidential support off campus. Section four is related to amnesty policies. Um, there were no proposed changes to the amnesty policy uh, recommendation. This was one of the earliest sections of the bill that enjoyed near unanimous support of the council. Uh, most neighboring New England states have the same or similar language in their statutes protecting students who are victims or witness to sexual assault in reporting such incidents. Um, section five is around annual awareness programming and training. Uh, the changes were very minimal here, um, which just kind of ensured that proposed changes uh, brought in a range of stakeholders and that all on-campus and off-campus reporting options are included in annual training that's provided by institutions of higher education. Um, and we're also proposing that this training or related information is available on the institution's website so that it's not just a one, one dose, one time training, but that someone can go back to it um, and refer to it over time. And section six is about the Intercollegiate Sexual Harm Prevention Council. I'll just note that uh, you know this is really a body that brings together a diverse set of stakeholders, many, many stakeholders from higher education institutions as well as the law enforcement community, advocacy communities, has student representatives. Um, and so it has been a really important body to moving this work forward. And the only proposed revisions to this section include replacing um, the original bill had uh, that the council would host an annual conference um, and changing that language to annual training opportunities um, and re repealing the sunset of the council in 2025 when it is scheduled to sunset. So that's a pretty high level overview of the changes that we are proposing. Um, the, obviously the most significant one is the removal of section one. Um, but I would be more than happy to take any questions from committee members on those changes or the process. Yeah, on the resource advisors, yes. this is, um, is this something that institutions are hiring people or it's more the dean of student, the assistant dean of students can also be the resource advisor? Yeah, so that, it's a great question to ask um, the institutions of higher education, how they would operationalize that. Yeah. Um, but by and large, what we hear is that they, there are staff who already can sure. serve in this right. capacity. Thank you. Senator Hashim. Thank you. Um, and also thank you for all the work yep. that you've done over the summer. Um, the question I have, it might be a multi-part question, but the, uh, so first with section two, uh, removing the confidentiality privilege uh, for the positions. I was wondering about that and then I was also wondering if it in any way interacts with the in section three um, offering confidential support 
and advocacy with protections from requests or subpoenas? Or is that just, are these two, are they two different positions? Is that why? They're different? actually, yeah, they're actually two things that go together. So um, the resource advisors are on campus university employees. Mm -hmm. um, and so they, as employees of the institution, um, they really can't have crisis worker privilege in the same way that a community-based advocate will, would. Um, and in part, that's because they're employees of an institution. And so um, their documents, their um, equipment, their emails is all the property of the institution. Um, and so we wanted to just be clear that these resource, uh, the advocacy coordinators on campus can provide information to students, can be a resource for students, but that if they need confidential advocacy, that seeking that from a community-based advocate that works at one of our member organizations um, is going to provide the greatest confidentiality protections. So that's the reason that um, we are asking institutions of higher education to have memorandums of understanding between their institutions and the community-based organization that serves their area. So is the advocacy coordinator a sort of bridge to the crisis worker? That's exactly it. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Yes, uh, section six, I was wondering, um, in repealing the sunset, are you asking for it to remain in perpetuity? Yeah. For now, um, you know, a policy decision on your, um, on your part in terms of whether you want to extend that, but I think that um, we definitely see the advantage to bringing this group of individuals together um, over time, and that it, at a minimum, we'd want to extend it for several more years. On the climate survey, yes. Uh, campuses are doing, is it safe to say, a, a range of things in terms of uh, their approach to climate surveys, but they're doing them. I think broadly that is accurate, okay. and that's what we hear from campuses. The intent of the section as it was originally introduced was to ensure that there was some consistency across the state, because one of the things we can't do now is people ask, how many students experience sexual assault mm -hmm. on college campuses in Vermont? I can't answer that question really well um, because there's federal reporting requirements, right. um, but we know that that captures a very, very, very small number of the actual assaults that happen. Um, and one of the best and evidence-based ways to understand the prevalence of sexual assault within an institution is to do a climate survey. Um, and Schools and uh, institutions of higher education do operationalize that in different ways right now. Our original intent was to have some similar metrics that we could kind of create a, a statewide picture um, and say across the state, uh, you know, 45% of students report X or Y. Um, but it just, um, in our conversations on the council, there were a lot of excellent questions raised by institutions of higher education and a desire to use the tools that they're already using, um, that they have faith in and appreciate. Um, and so we we certainly understand um, that desire for that kind of flexibility. Um, I will say, just from the network's perspective, we would love to come back to this conversation at some point in the future. Um, and I do think that perhaps Title IX regulations will give us some um, clarity about campus climate surveys as well, and those have not yet been released. And when are they going to be released, do you know? That's a great question. Because I think we were waiting last year, we were talking we about were. release. We right. were. Yeah, and um, there was hope at some point that they were going to be released by September. They're, uh -huh. they're in the final stages, so okay. it should be within the next few months, but I feel like I've been saying that for two years now, so. Whose mm -hmm. report is Taiwan? Sorry, what was that? Whose report is, uh, is it a federal? Um, yes, the the uh, Title IX stuff that we're waiting on for. Yes, that is all federal Title IX exactly that we're waiting from the U.S. Department of Education. Anything else? Any other questions? Uh, one, yes. one question. So uh, the advocacy coordinators, um, with what exists currently, they don't. Is there just sort of a patchwork policy? Like it depends on the university Correct. or the college? Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Ms. Conant. 
leave here. Unless I have the wrong order here, do I? Have no, that's the order that okay. I have. Um, I'm going to introduce two of my colleagues oh. who um, are much more well More fluent. Than I. Okay. Um, so Emily McCarthy, who is the Title IX coordinator at the University of Vermont, and Jennifer Papillo from our Office of General Counsel. Terrific. Um, Jim, you can bring a chair up. Yeah, please bring a chair up. And Emily. Yes, yeah. 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 Emily, you're the director. I'm the Title IX coordinator. Coordinator. Yes. So, Nice. Uh, thanks for joining us. I think it's your first time in Senate Education. It is. Uh, <clears throat> this is. I'll let everybody introduce themselves so you know where we are and where we're from. Please. Senator Terry Williams from the Rutland District. Nice to meet you. Good afternoon. Dave Weeks, Rutland District. Brian Campion, Bennington. Martine LaRock, Gulick, Burlington, Winooski, Essex, Chester. I'm not a machine, Wyndham County. Thanks for being nice to us. meet you. Great Thank you. All right. Um, I'm Emily McCarthy, the Title IX coordinator at um, UVM. Um, but prior to working at UVM, I was a deputy state's attorney in Chittenden County for five years. Um, two of those years, I served as the prosecutor for CUSI, the Chittenden Unit for Special Investigations that does um, sex crimes prosecutions. So I thought that background might be helpful. Um, you know, we can walk through this bill and some of the proposed amendments. Um, you know, we would be in agreement with the um, amendment to strike section one okay. for a number of reasons. And maybe I'm just going to jump to my experience on the council. Sure. Um, so in support of that, I sit on the intercollegiate council and was specifically on the subcommittee that discussed um, the campus climate surveys. And as a subcommittee, we really had difficulty um, coming a to a consensus um, about this topic because in part, um, the people on the committee, we, we lack the expertise, I think, required to develop um, a, a survey like this. There's a lot of nuance that needs to be taken into consideration in gathering this evidence um, based on particular campus climates and number of questions and the pacing of questions. Uh, as part of the, our review, we did look at sample surveys, um, and some of those sample surveys felt really intimidating towards students based on the level of detail that the questions asked and the number of questions that we really feared um, would be re-traumatizing for a student, especially when given to them in, the, in a very cold way, not in a supportive environment. Um, we did have a student who sat on this sub-council or subcommittee um, and in looking through them, she agreed that like th that felt harmful to answer that level of, of, of detailed questions. So, Ms. McCarthy, you you do a survey at UVM, and it's it's your own sort of thing that you all come up with in the climate, the culture of the university. So, great question. So, I, um, yes, we do have a campus climate survey that is broader, um, that can contain some questions related to campus sexual misconduct and experience on campus. Um, we, I think, uh, try to be intentional about every question that's on that survey and have, um, we have, I'm trying to remember the position title, um, but someone who is, um, they're professional. Um, in this type of survey work. In addition, we've been able to gather, I think, important information in a number of different ways. Um, so while we might not have an exact number where we've surveyed every single person on campus, um, we are, uh, our Cleary, um, we have federal data reporting statistics that we report. Um, our office this year for the first time um, reported numbers um, and those were posted in December about numbers and types of incidents um, and that was going through um, incidents that were reported to the Title IX office. Um, and then also every other month we meet with Hope Works, um, which is an advocacy yeah. organization in the community um, and we meet the, with them every month and one of the things, or every other month, one of the things that we do with them is we go over trends that they're seeing. Um, and so just, you know, what are you seeing here? What are you seeing there? And we pass along that information to our education provider so that they know what they're seeing and how we need to be um, tailoring education to, to those trends. I was just curious if the, the survey you were referencing was uh, that, that had kind of a re-traumatizing effect. Was that the general survey or was that, a, was that like a, a Questionnaire given to a victim. So, so the question. So, 
some of the sample surveys um, that I've looked at is it would be to all students to okay. so, right. Okay, it's not just somebody who has reported an experience. Yes, yeah. but yeah. that was what you were discussing in, on the council. That's not the survey you have. Exactly. Right. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Wait, you want to take us through? So section two. Right. So section two, um, the advocacy coordinator. Um, so I'd say, you know, we don't dispute that confidential resources should be available to all members, you know, of the campus community. Um, however, we want to do it in uh, in a different way than is outlined in either the bill as proposed or the amendments as proposed. Thought it may be helpful to give you an idea of what we do at UVF. Um, and so what we do is we contract with an organization called HopeWorks. Um, they're a community advocacy organization. And this works well because they provide 24-7 um, availability, 365 days a year through a number of different mediums. They're in person, they're over the phone, they have a hotline, a text line. Um, and additionally, there are a number of different advocates um, who represent diverse identities, which has been something that um, UVM interests or UVM students have found um, supportive. And so, you know, a number of years ago, prior to taking on HopeWorks, we had a single confidential on-campus advocate, um, as is proposed by the original bill. And um, that didn't serve our campus well. In fact, our students asked to move away from that model. Um, that was specifically one of their demands um, during that time of protest um, because of not having as much availability. Um, and some students um, you know, didn't connect well with that one particular individual um, and wanted more options. Um, so, <clears throat> All right. so I think the other piece that's important, so happy to hear about yeah. some of the proposed amendments um, that, that do make progress from the original proposed legislation. Um, but one concern remains with the advocacy, advocacy coordinator role, and that is that it is specifically geared towards uh, reporting parties. We have an obligation as an institution to provide support for all members of our campus community. Um, and so if this position is providing support in a confidential way, it really can't be in a confidential way as, as was pointed out because of the crisis worker privilege. And so um, we need to be very clear with our students what this position is, what it is not. If they share information with an uh, advocacy coordinator, that is notice to the institution. We do need to act on that. Um, but we also need to provide that level of support to our respondents and to witnesses in, in any situation. And so we actually have positions along these lines that um, sit in Emily's office and provide this level of support to all parties throughout the process. And so we'd be really interested in um, working to make, if there is legislation, to working to make that language really clear and ensure that we are not creating a biased environment in that space. Yeah. And just, to, you're working off of this submission, correct? Or no? We don't have that yeah. submission, okay. but but based on what we have heard, okay. yes. <laughs> that what I submitted was the uh, what the council approved at the December. Oh meeting. yes, okay. Yeah. yeah. So we had the draft yeah. legislation that the council voted on, but yes. Um, all right. So the next section is. Uh, did you have anything else to say? Okay. Uh, the next section. I'm sorry. I'm Jen <laughs> I'm in our general counsel's office. Um, so I'm an attorney for the institution, but uh, importantly, sort of I focus in the student affairs space, mm -hmm. regulatory compliance space, public safety space, um, and I've been at UVM for almost 14 years. Um, and so I have been through the full evolution of uh, sexual misconduct reporting response on our campus since the 2011 um, Dear Colleague letter from the US Department of Education. So. I sort of rode the waves um, and am uh, familiar not just with the legal landscape but with our operational capacity as well. So really thankful that you all have us here today. Um, the third section is about MOUs um, with the network or with the network's uh, affiliate organizations, HopeWorks being one of them. Um, we're very proud of our relationship with HopeWorks. We're also very proud of that relationship because we had the choice to enter it, um, and it made good business sense. We were able to negotiate those terms according to what worked well for us, what worked well for HopeWorks, 
Um, and so we encourage any institution to consider that, consider having an MOU, absolutely have a relationship, engage in information sharing, education about processes. Um, we really just feel like it's not uh, a one size fits all approach, if you will. Um, and so don't feel like there is a need to mandate an MOU to be in place. I think that's really up to the campus culture, what the needs are of that campus. Um, we do have confidential resources on our campus that are not uh, from HopeWorks, right? We offer counseling and psychiatry services and well, other you things. Have, you do have an MOU with HopeWorks? We have a contract for services contract with HopeWorks okay. uh, to provide a certain number of on-campus hours of their advocates. They also, because of the nature of their services and the fact that our campus community is part of Chittenden County, right, all of our folks are eligible to use their hotline, to use their off-campus services, et cetera, as any member of the town would be. So that was uh, part of my first question. And so I, I guess the second question is if you don't have an MOU, but you have a contract, how would an MOU change your current relationship um, with HopeWorks? It likely would not, other than that it would not be our choice to have that relationship. Section four. Yes. So, amnesty. Um, so while we very much agree with an amnesty provision, and UVM has its own amnesty provision, um, we like ours better um, than um, for a couple of reasons. Um, the, the bill as drafted raises a couple of logistical concerns that we see sometimes in these cases. Um, the first is when we have students who make cross complaints against each other. Um, so when one student accuses the other student of either sexual misconduct or relationship violence, and the other student in the same scenario accuses the other student back of that same conduct. The Title IX regs require that we can't pick a side about which one we investigate. We have to investigate both. Um, and so the way UVM has our provision written um, doesn't preclude that, um, but it's, that's potentially an issue in the language as it's drafted here. Um, the other concern is that um, sometimes in these cases, we don't, well, ha for example, in a, in a rela relationship violence matter in assault, sometimes we don't know have a clear understanding of the relationship between the two students, whether they are in a dating relationship or not. Sometimes that's part of what we have to investigate. And so when that relationship is unclear, we add a charge under the general student code of conduct for an assault to make sure that if the investigation determines that there was not a dating relationship between the two, that then there can be a finding that there was an ass assault even if that dating relationship didn't exist. So that's, that's yeah. all we have okay. on that. Yeah. Okay. So agree with the principle. We have that principle right. in place for, for all campus. types of conduct on our campus. Most frequently that comes up with if there's concerns about underage drinking. We are not going to pursue an underage drinking charge. We'd rather hear about the other concerning behavior that has occurred. That happens with all types of student conduct on our campus, not just sexual misconduct. So absolutely agree with the concept. It's really in the logistics and, and precise wording that we would have some concerns. Uh, the next section is, oh, yeah, sorry. If we were to mark this up and be more precise and also address the um, cross complaint mm -hmm. issue that was raised, would you be in support of it, this section? Uh, with our work, yes, uh, right, we do it now so we're in support it's it's a matter of uh ensuring that the concerns of our campus that we have had experience with match what the requirement is that makes sense yep um so the next section is on annual awareness programming and training um again our we are in support of having annual awareness programming and training um, what this comes down to is uh, this language feels very duplicative of many federal requirements that we are already subject to. So there is a, a good amount of training required of our student body as well as our employees around these issues. They are mandated by the Campus Sexual Violence Elimination Act or the SAVE Act, which was part of the VAWA reauthorization. Um, and so we offer primary prevention programming. We offer continuing education. 
We also expect, as was referenced, to have uh, new Title IX regulations coming out in the coming months, which very well could speak to these issues. So our concern is um, not confusing the landscape, if you will. Uh, we are subject to requirements. We have flexibility within those requirements to ensure that that programming is tailored to our campus community, to our culture, is relevant. Um, and so we would just uh, seek to remove that section from this particular legislation so that folks are have a clear, a clear path forward. Yeah. So section six, I don't know, Wendy, if you want to speak to this, it's about the existence of the council. I think we are all super supportive yeah. to have a council. Yeah. Um, I think the question continues to remain of what is the appropriate makeup. We want to make sure that all campuses um, are able to access this really important information, the ability to do resource sharing as comprised right now, and I'm sure others will speak to this. Um, UVM is represented, the state colleges are represented. We have a lot of independent colleges that right now have a representative. Um, that doesn't necessarily promote the information sharing to make sure all of those campuses are included. We'd love to be able to expand on that point. I'm sure Susan. Yes, yeah, I'm sure Susan, Susan will speak to that. Real quick, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't no. fully, can, can we go back to section five? Because I wasn't, Sure. I don't, so you're not you're not in support of Section Five, is what I took away. From. We are not because um, while it is very similar to what's required at the federal level, it is not exact, and we would rather have one place to refer to of what our training requirements are, simply to make it easier to administer, understand what our obligations are. We don't want to have those competing compliance obligations. Got it. And what are are any of the main differences listed in one of the um, on 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 this list? Or right, let me rephrase the question: What what are the uh, main differences uh, between what's proposed versus what you're already doing? It, there is not a lot of difference between what our campus is presently doing. Um, but that said, the federal regulations allow more latitude for campuses to design it with respect to their campus population than some of the language that's contained in the proposed bill. Um, and so we feel like it's really important for campuses to be able to have that level of autonomy to make sure that what they are doing reflects their campus community's needs. Um, and I could go through and write red line yeah. exactly what the differences are between federal law and what's being proposed, but I think the, the overarching concern is that we are doing this work we don't feel like additional regulation or additional mandates around that are necessary. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. For the record, Susan Stightley with the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges. Um, I haven't seen this latest draft, uh, and so some of what I was going to say I will skip over, uh, and some of what I say might not be as relevant because things have been changed. Uh, what, what draft are you? Well, well you mean this is just testimony and response yes, to yes, 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 yeah, yes, yeah. 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 Um, so you know, we ad admire what the council is doing and support yeah. their intentions, and our colleges work hard to protect students from sexual harm. Although we support their intentions, there are still parts of the bill and the legislation that we can't support. Um, um, we certainly support eliminating the uh, campus sexual misconduct survey and I just want to make it I'll make a few comments about that that might just be relevant to information so in 2022 Congress um, charged the Department of Education with coming up with a climate survey on sexual harm and the Department of Education will be charged with overseeing that uh, survey and administering it every two years this is still a work in progress it hasn't happened yet but it is in the works so you know one of my concerns was there's why do this work at the state level when the federal uh, level is happening, or probably slowly, but happening. So I just wanted to point that out, that that is uh, happening there. 
And uh, just a few words about the Clery Act, which requires institutions to collect data on domestic violence, dating violence, stalking hate crimes, and violence against women act offenses. So the colleges collect that data, and they are required to post it on their uh, websites. Uh, one of the concerns, and I'll just mention this briefly with the uh, one size fits all, you know, we have some really small colleges in Vermont. Center for Cartoon Studies has 30 students approximately. Sterling has 70 or 80. So when you collect data with specific information like that uh, in a small institution, the students know who you're talking about. Uh, on that same situation with small public schools. Yeah. Small, yeah collect certain data around test scores, all that kind of thing. And I don't know if, it's, if we have a ban on it, but there's something that does not allow us, I believe, in the state. I have to check with the agency St. James, but some data is not collected. Right, so because of confidentiality. So that would have been one one concern if we had continued with the misconduct survey. Uh, one thing about Title IX that I have heard recently, of course, it may be released me next month. It may not be. Uh, early February, uh, it was sent to the Office of Budget Management, and they have 90 days to respond. So if they take their full 90 days, we're still looking at you know two and a half months before the rights are uh, released. I would like to talk, again, I, there, it sounds like there's some language changes on the advocacy coordinator. Uh, so I'll proposed. just propose yeah. changes. So, um, so some of what I might say might not be irrelevant. But um, we, the, what I had been reading says that you shall hire uh, an advocacy coordinator. And the US has a long labor history that hiring is based on the need as determined by an employer. And the Supreme Court has constitutionalized the common law of employment by placing the freedom to contract within the liberties protected by the Fifth and the Fourteenth Amendments. So freedom to contract you know, is allowing the parties that they should be free to choose their contracting partners and to agree to the terms of the contract without government restrictions. As it was originally written, the, and I gather it's been changed, there was a, a mandate that we should hire an advocacy coordinator, and it dictated who that person should or should not be. It di dictated their, uh, their roles and their uh, job responsibilities. So if that should stay in there, uh, our college, as you know, are living in challenging times, financial times, so we would ask that there be an appropriation if it's a res required to support an advocacy coordinator. Essentially, that same principle of freedom of contract applies to an MOU, even though technically that's not a contract, depending on how it's written. Um, but we don't think the state should be, Senator, yeah. I'm sorry, uh, before we get to the MOUs, I actually just wanted to throw a question to the ledge council real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, Beth, regarding the advocacy coordinators and the contracting, is is it unconstitutional to require this type of position? Unless you're going to ask me about Beth St. James, <laughs> the Legislative Council, um, that's not the type of analysis I can just do okay. on the fly. Unless you're going to ask me about Carson Bacon, <laughs> I can't. Okay. Uh, no but I can certainly look into it for you. Thank you. Sorry. Uh, yes. Oh, back. I think I was going to talk about the MOU. Uh, so we we support uh, working with advocacy groups, and we do work with advocacy groups, but we don't support requiring that we work with a specific ad advocacy group. Uh, most of our colleges work with the members of the network already, but what if a new organization appeared and we thought it was better? Uh, then we would not be free to work with who we thought was best. Um, as far as the amnesty provision on Section 4, we agree with UVM that it should probably be reworked and that it's really best if uh, it's uh, left up to the institutions. You know, each institution has different needs. For example, Norwich University may want to have their amnesty read a little differently uh, compared to Sterling College. And on Section 5, the annual training, again, um, uh, the colleges already provide annual tr awareness training uh, to students and to employees, and if they needed guidance, they would reach out to the network. But mandating that the network provides the guidance, I think, is an overreach. 
most colleges already have contracts with vendors to implement the trainings for students and employees. So if this was required, uh, that they work with the network, would we, be, would we be required to break the contracts? And again, I think this violates um, the freedom to contract philosophy. Uh, I, as far as uh, Section 6, um, I, I think it would be good and needed to, uh, to re redefine the role of the council uh, and what, what is needed uh, before the, uh, I could support or not support that. Any questions from the state? Thank you. Ms. Robinson, when you, I'm wondering before we move on to our last minutes, what would you say is the problem we're trying to solve with the changes that you've offered forward? Uh, in large part. In large part, yeah, just sort yeah. of the elevator speech. Yeah, in large part, it was um, responding to a lot of testimony last year around allowing institutions of higher education to have the operational flexibility that mm -hmm. they um, said that they needed. Okay, thank you very much. Ready? Great. Let's start this from uh, Planned Parenthood, although you may remember last year when we talked about this bill, I was the one that came and talked to you about it from the network. Yes, yes. Um, so well, I have been working on job. these issues in various capacities for many years and excited to come talk to you about it from the perspective of Planned Parenthood in the Vermont Action Fund. Um, so you may know us as Planned Parenthood of Northern New England. That is our C3 side that serves patients in our health centers and provides sexual and reproductive health care. We also have a Planned Parenthood Vermont Action Fund, which is an independent not-for-profit organization, which is our advocacy and political arm of Planned Parenthood of Northern New England. And at the Action Fund, we engage in educational and electoral activity, including voter registration, grassroots organizing, and legislative advocacy. And one of the big priorities of the Action Fund is supporting student organizing on college campuses across Vermont through what's called Planned Parenthood Generation Action, uh, also known as Gen Action, has over 350 campus groups across the country. And we have four active teams here in Vermont uh, at Bennington, Middlebury, NBU Linden, and UVM. And the goal of Gen Action teams is to raise public awareness about reproductive health and rights educate young people about sexual health and create lasting change in their communities. Gen Action teams in Vermont have led initiatives to bring sexual and reproductive health care education to campuses by organizing sexual health and wellness fairs, tabling to bring resources to their students, and hosting sex education trivia events. They have also championed programs to bring safe sex supplies to their peers for free, like in Bennington, where students now have access to free and anonymous condoms, dental dams, pregnancy tests, and emergency contraception delivered right to their dorm rooms. So broadly speaking, as an organization whose mission it is to advance access to sexual health care and defend reproductive rights, we believe everyone should have the right to an education free from sexual harm. And so we wholeheartedly support S120, um, as well as all of the suggested language changes that have been brought by the network and the Intercollegiate Council, with one exception um, in section one, which I'll talk about. Uh, sexual harm is widely underreported. In fact, it is estimated that only 12% of campus sexual harm is ever reported to Title IX offices. So as a result, official Title IX data is an ineffective method to understand the true scope of this issue, which leaves us without any clear data on how many students experience campus sexual harm in Vermont each year. According to Know Your Nine, which is a national advocacy organization, they estimate about 19% of women, 6% of men are assaulted during their years at college. Um, and these numbers are even higher for LGBTQ plus students, students of color, and students with disabilities. We know from our experiences working directly with students across Vermont universities that sexual misconduct is pervasive at all of our schools in Vermont. However, without the data to back up what students are saying, it's really difficult for us to demonstrate that to you all um, if you're not embedded in those college life with those kids. 
And so it is really critical that you all in the Vermont legislature have real time information from the student perspective on what they're experiencing, how they're being supported or not, and how they're handling these experiences at their school. Uh, which is why we really strongly encourage you to consider leaving section one in, which is the sexual misconduct campus climate survey. Um, this is mostly for that statewide consistency reporting to help you all do your jobs most effectively. It, this statewide campus climate survey would provide the legislature with the data you need to make informed decisions about how best to support students and universities to navigate sexual misconduct prevention and support. This data that would be collected through a survey would better support the state taking a data informed approach to evaluating which proactive and responsive measures are working or are not working. Uh, we know from talking with many students that they would really appreciate the opportunity to share their experiences of sexual harm to help ensure that their experience is not repeated and to promote positive changes on their campuses. The process includes a rigorous informed consent which ensures that all students are aware of the risks and privacy concerns of sharing information in a survey. And they can opt out of the process at any time. Under S120, students will not be required to participate in any part of a climate survey process. This survey will not create added harm. Student voice and experience are a critical part of the discourse on how campuses address sexual misconduct and a regulated statewide campus climate survey is the most effective and non-invasive way for them to do so. Um, and I will also just mention that a few years ago, New Hampshire passed a similar provision and they have done a lot of research with folks at Dartmouth um, and have a really comprehensive system for how to do it in an effective and trauma-informed way across the entire state that is very similar to ours. Uh, moving on to section two and three, uh, students who experience sexual harms are more likely to miss class, experience disruptions in their ability to produce assignments at the level they were previously capable of, and even drop out entirely. Support systems are critical for the long-term management of the physical and mental impacts of sexual harm. Currently, the supports available to students who experience sexual harm varies widely depending on what institution they attend. Sections two and three would provide consistent support to all students in Vermont, regardless of where they choose to study, and would expand on-campus supports to options outside of the federally regulated Title IX office. And I think this is a really key part of these sections, um, particularly section two, um, because the regulations and requirements of federal programs like Title IX can change drastically based on our federal administrations. Even under the best of national circumstances, the rules associated with Title IX are often focused on legal processes and risks to the educational institution itself, rather than focusing on the individual needs of a survivor. With less than 12% of all campus sexual harm being reported to Title IX offices, Students have made it very clear that it is not an effective or acceptable support system for them. Title IX offices cannot be the sole sexual harm support processes on our college campuses. Um, and based on what you've heard today, I just want to also highlight that section three, the reason that language names the network and the network associated programs is because they are the federally recognized domestic and sexual violence programs in the state, and they are the only ones that provide these services. So there would not be another organization, there's no free market of domestic and sexual violence services of which to contract from. Uh, importantly, this bill also recognizes and supports students who do want to pursue legal options through the Title IX office in Section 4 by better ensuring students can safely report their experiences without fear or incurring conduct violations. Currently, some students may choose not to report their experiences because they are worried about disciplinary action or other ramifications. Institutions across Vermont have widely varying amnesty provisions and many are at the discretion of a particular administrator. 
Um, and so on some campuses, students who experience sexual harm where alcohol or drug use may have been involved could risk expulsion or the loss of scholarship if they report their assault. Section four better ensures that post-secondary students in Vermont can safely report their assault. Um, and I will also just note, having been doing this work for a while, uh, that this was part of the explicit charge of creating the Intercollegiate Council and the original legislation from this body. Um, this was explicitly mentioned as a remedy that needed to be, or an inequity that needed to be remedied. Uh, and you know, students need to have access to these essential supports and services across the whole spectrum. We need to provide all of these different supports for them. Uh, section five, uh, evidence-based informed sexual education and prevention training, like that required in this section five, is critical to reducing the many sexual harm incidences on post-secondary campuses each year. Again, this is a place where this is providing consistency across the state. Some universities do a really good job. Some need some additional support. And the provisions found here in Section 5 are common sense best practice that should be implemented across all of our schools. So students are receiving that no matter where they go. Um, and I will note that Planned Parenthood Vermont Action Fund is happy to support the implementation of best practices in these efforts wherever as possible. Uh, section six involves the continuation of the Intercollegiate Sexual Harm Prevention Council, as you've heard. And these issues of sexual harm on our campuses are systemic and pervasive, and they are going to require a multi-year coordinated response and support system. And the council is really the most effective way for providing those essential services to coordinate, share resources, and develop statewide best practices. Sexual harm is an issue on all of our campuses, big and small, and it is a benefit to all of our post-secondary schools to have access to this council's shared knowledge and expertise. So we wholeheartedly support the continuation of the council and its sustained funding. Um, and I will just close by saying that you have heard and probably will hear from other institutions that some of these provisions are costly or unnecessary. Uh, but let's be clear, assault is costly and unnecessary. Sexual misconduct in any form can have lasting negative impacts on a survivor's mental and physical health. 34% of college student survivors will experience PTSD as opposed to 9% of non-survivors. While there are a few cost estimates on the economic implications of sexual assault, uh, a national 2014 study found that um, the costs range from about 87,000 to 240,000 per rape. And for student survivors, costs can also include tutoring, lost tuition, and accrued student loan interest if they take a leave of absence. There is a significant problem of sexual harm happening on college campuses in our country, including here in Vermont and our post-secondary schools must do a better job of addressing sexual misconduct and protecting the students who are in their care and their programs. S120 is a necessary and tangible step toward making our schools a safer place for everyone to learn and grow. We simply cannot afford not to enact these provisions to change the course of sexual misconduct on our campuses. And we must act now to better support and educate Vermont's post-secondary students. Rep. Rachel Sin, you have this companion bill in House Judiciary? No, in House Education. It is in House Education. Thank you. Please, questions? Comments? Do we have a copy of your testimony? I'll send it. That would be great. And that would go for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anything else? Committee, what would you like <coughs> to do? Energy. Yeah, I mean, I think the the first thing I, I, I can see the cross complaint issue um, and, and doing some wordsmithing there for section four, and I think the question is still open as to whether or not we can require a uh, private college to employ a certain uh, a certain person to fulfill a certain role. The rest of it. 
seems more like it seems like things that are being done now, um, which I appreciate and I'm very grateful for. Uh, but you know, as as a policymaker, it's some not just looking at next year or, a, or two years down the road, it's kind of 15 years down the road. And, you know, the folks who are doing awesome work right now and the folks who are setting the policy on the campuses right now are, sounds like they're doing good work, they may not be there in 10 or 15 years. And so, you know, I'm, I'm looking at the long game for this and, you know, I, I understand it's, you know, people don't like being told what to do, but, um, that's that is part of our job when it comes to making policy. So those are my initial takeaways. No. <clears throat> Others. I don't know the one standout uh, from from given the feedback and what's dropped in the bill is the um, council seems to be something that's unique to the state. You know, there's a lot of other federal mandates and such and think things that they're already doing, but. Council seems to be a real standout. Is that's a unique ask? Hmm. Okay. Perhaps, yeah. I was the only woman on the committee and someone who went to college in the 1980s. Uh, I feel very strongly about um, this bill. I also, it's really the first time we've looked at it, and I'd like to have a little bit of time to think about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Anything else? Anything else from any of our witnesses? I just want to say yes. that, um, you know, <clears throat> in this realm and many others, you know, the network uh, would be more than happy if there's any pieces that you'd like us to connect directly with stakeholders and see if we can come to additional agreement and come back to you. Please do let us know. Um, and we'd be more than happy to work on that process. I appreciate that. And so I think working a little bit with Senator Hashim, uh, and maybe you and I and Beth and anybody else who wants to be involved, <clears throat> um, after we hear more committee feedback next week, we might get together and have a conversation. See if we can move something in the next couple of weeks. And this might be something also the committee on committees might give us a little extra time for if we need it. So. Final piece of business, Senator Hashim. Do you want to let us know your conversation with Senator Sears about libraries and firearms? Oh, <clears throat> that would be great. Yes. And Ms. St. James, this will give some direction to you. And then, Is it on the library bill? Oh, that's right, it's the library. library. Yes, 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 yes. And we'll let everyone go home since next week we are going to be busy, busy, busy. So, please. Yes, that's uh, it's going to go into a judiciary bill from the House. Yes. And they can have it up. In Asheville. So, uh, can you repeat the? This is the firearm section of the library. Okay. Yeah. So, so, the recommendation from the Senate Judiciary is for us to yank it, and the House will work on it in a House Judiciary bill that is looking at other sensitive places. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. <laughs> sounds like. Sounds unanimous. Sounds unanimous. <laughs> Okay, have a great weekend, everybody. Thank you. I know next week is going to be crazy. So, S crazy good. Well, I know. Some weeks are crazier than others, S203, can we bring that baby back? Bring that baby back.